Hard to keep a straight face while listening to this at work. (laughs) (laughs) My question is... Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined as always by the voice of CinemaSins, Jeremy Scott. Hello, howdy. And from Music Video Sins, Barrett Share. Yo, people. Yo, people. Yo. Yo, Pete. Yo, yo, yo teach. teach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, yo, teach is still the best part of oh, funny people. Oh, it's by far that and, that and that awkward joke he makes about the Holocaust in the bar at the Jew, Jewish singles night. <laughs> it's uh, awful. <laughs> Uh, today we're gonna go back on our road trip. Our <laughs> road trip. Hey, shotgun. On the road again. The most time-honored tradition of all. The road trip. Oh, the places you'll go. Are we there yet? No. 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 Yeah, we are going to be doing West Virginia today. Country room. And they're, they're like, I'm like, okay, we're in the W's. We're, we're def- this is definitely the last one. And then it's like, oh, there's Wyoming. Yeah, it's two more. Uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Oh, fucking, is there no, there's no Z states, though. No, no, there's not. We are almost done with this Phew. segment. Yeah, we better start cramming on what we're going to do next. <laughs> yeah. I, think we'll, I think we'll find something. Yeah. Uh, West Virginia, uh, a state, uh, not of many movies. Uh, do you like, have you been to West Virginia, if not through West Virginia? I've been right? through it. Have you been? I spent, <laughs> spent a month there one weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, what's the c name capital is it charleston or charlton or charlton <laughs> charleston west virginia is the capital i went there okay. for a wedding mm-hmm. and gorgeous city mm-hmm. like sitting there like nestled with like smoky mountain peaks all around i don't think there's smoky mountains at that point but um anyway uh i love my time there uh my hair was orange what I tried to dye it blonde. It came out orange. There wasn't time or money to fix it before the wedding. And the groom. This must have been a damn long time ago. The groom was pissed. I was also the best man and failed to stop the second best man from putting fish inside the engine block of the car hmm. so that it would slowly start to stink like fish. And they would have to search a really long time to find it. Oh, my. And their whole honeymoon, their car smelled like fish. Oh. I basically ruined their lives. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's, it reminds me of that How I Met Your Mother episode where Jason Siegel's getting married, and he freaks out, and he takes a hair clippers and goes, ah! And it, like, shaves no, off yeah. a strip <laughs> yeah. from his head. I haven't seen that. <laughs> it's a it's a great episode. Oh but man, you, were you trying to do like a frosted tips thing? Or oh, was it- no, I was just trying to go. I had gone blonde once, like <laughs> a year earlier, just for shits and giggles. <laughs> like Eminem blonde? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I've got pictures. I'll find. Them. <laughs> this time out, those. I, I did something those. wrong or bought the wrong shade or what have you. It came out orange. <laughs> For a day, I was like, "It's gonna go. It's gonna turn more blonde as I wash it." And then it's just. It, it looked like a BTS member. I probably did. Yes, like before any of those guys were born. This was back in. This would have been like ninety five. Yeah, I was about to say, wow. like the idea of you going anywhere to do anything to your hair had to have been something sub like 20 years old pre-wife yeah <laughs> when i'm still in, in that sort of courting stage of my life yeah. i still put gel in my hair and shit yeah no fucking way that was like in the last 20 years nope. um uh, starting off with big business spending cheese um it's got <laughs> bet midler and lily tomlin in it and it's based on comedy of errors i've never seen this that sounds it sounds like a winner Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not joking. No, no it's like, it is. those are talented Timo. people. Yeah. They, uh, so they're playing twins of each other. So Lily Tomlin is playing herself and another character twin. that's her twin. And then Bette Midler is also a twin of herself. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so one set of twins, they're not together, though. So Lily Tomlin and Bette Midler are like these big, bus- big business executives mm-hmm. in like New York and something like that. And the other set that were separated at birth are stuck in West Virginia. They're successful. But they, through a comedy of errors, they have to trade um, places. Trade places, and then like make business decisions and business business. Do we business get to see the talking. business people down on the farm too? 
Like the business twins? Yes. Yes. And then, and then business <laughs> twins. And then, of course, they meet up and all that stuff. Uh, all right. Well, that and they, uh, they meet up, and I think they join forces to take over or to stop some corporate malfeasance from happening. Ooh, or like malfeasance. As typically happens in 80s movies. Yes, that, like, this, this is a very funny movie, actually. I, I used to watch it a lot. This was on the VHS mm-hmm. uh, rotation. And, uh, yeah, those are two very talented, like almost in their prime, comedians. Hmm. Yep. Comedians. Comedians with two N's and a couple E's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Fred Ward and uh, Michael Gross is in that. Oh, yeah. And oh. Edward Harriman, who seems to be in every late 80s movie, mm-hmm. especially Herman? about Herman. Is it? I think it's Herman. Edward Herman is in all of those corporate AKA, grade yeah. things. Yeah. yeah, he does show up a lot in those in those type of things, doesn't he? He's yeah. uh, And then he shows up in... Uh, Gilmore Girls as the uh, patriarch of that whole. Who's oh. a greedy bastard, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about the guy from the vampire movie on he, the beach. He just... <laughs> <laughs> the Lost Boys? Lost Boys. Is that him? He's I in, think he's in that, yeah. He's in Lost Boys. He's like the guy that she's dating who turns out to be a vampire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this guy's yeah. had a weird career, yeah. man. He sure does. Plays, Actually, he, he plays just died recently. Max. <laughs> um, okay, and then we have Logan Lucky, a, a great movie from Steven Soderbergh that's kind of like uh, Oceans for the Southern Crowd. Yeah, they actually, no, we're cheating a little bit because I did list Logan Lucky in North Carolina, and I think we talked about it very, very briefly. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm glad you said that, the Oceans, uh, the Southern Oceans 11 or whatever it is, because they actually... They call them the Seven Eleven, Ocean Seven Eleven, or something like that in the movie. Oh, really? Meaning that they're referencing Ocean's Eleven as being. I actually a movie. don't remember that, but it's <laughs> that it, it makes total sense. Yeah. Um, it's Channing Tatum, Adam Driver. Uh, there's uh, Riley Keough's in this. Yeah, uh, Daniel is. Craig. Um, yeah, Riley Keough is pretty damn hot in this movie. She is. Uh, but, uh, Channing Tatum works in some sort of like, uh, digging, mining, whatever it's going on around a speedway of some sort. And, uh, he gets fired because he's got an injury that they think is going to cause a problem. And so what do we do for money now? (laughs) Uh, the idea is to rob the speedway on the biggest racing day of the year and using his, the knowledge he knows about how the vibrations and everything go on going on in the digging uh, cause the alarms to go off for no reason, they figure that they can do this with the alarms going off and people will just think it's been due to the, the blasting and everything that's going on. You way. know, if you hadn't said this was good and all you did was just what you said right there, describe the movie, that could easily be a terrible movie. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> yeah. it could. It yeah. could. sounds ridiculous. Donkulous. It is so good. It is so oh, good. It's man. on my list. I'm I'm very excited. The way to see that it. this it's campy in a way that I don't think I've ever seen Steven Soderbergh yeah. do before. It's insane. It's it's insane even for an oceans movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really like because dial up. they have to go. Channing Tatum and Adam Driver, they're brothers, right? Mm-hmm. They have to go in and and take Daniel Craig out of prison for this job. They have to break him out of prison so that he can help. Huh. And then put him back and then in. put him back without anybody <laughs> noticing. Without anybody knowing. Uh, and Daniel Craig, I've never seen Daniel Craig play outside of, like, almost a Bond character, yeah. right? He's always, even in, like, the Tomb Raider movie that he's in, like, he's always some sort of badass. But he's unhinged in this. Ooh. He's got, like, a, a West Virginia accent mm-hmm. and everything. Uh, he's, like, a bomb expert. Like, it's It's fucking awesome. Hmm. Katie Holmes is in this, too. Yeah, Whoa. briefly, very briefly. Like it's, She's uh, the West Virginia part, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Channing Tatum's ex-wife, and they have a, a, a you know, also, Hollywood always finds these cute little daughters. That's They're right. all, like the, the best kids in the world. Um, and uh, But uh, it's it's really fun. Yes, it is absolutely ridiculous, but uh, <laughs> it's fun. It's yeah. fun. Good movie. And yeah. I was the same way. Uh, when this came out, I was like, I want to see that. And then it came out and it went and I was like, okay, well, I'll see it when I can. And I didn't really hear much about it. And then I heard you and heard Dicer and everybody. And I was like, all right. I'll watch. It tells you about West Virginia's movies. If we just went from the B's to the L's. Yes. Like, <laughs> we didn't skip any. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's going to tell you even more that we go to the Mothman prophecies next. Oh, I've seen this movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Barrett in parentheses says most average movie ever. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the trailer came out. I think I was working at Hollywood 27 when this movie came out. The trailer comes out and I remember thinking that looks stupid as 
fuck. Uh-huh. Then the reviews were like, it's kind of scary. And yeah. I was like, okay, I'll watch it. And I came out thinking, that's kind of scary and stupid as fuck. <laughs> yes, it mm-hmm, is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, nobody believes this guy. It's just the, the, the effects are, you know, kind of sketchy. It's super dark. Like, the story is just, it's based on a true story. Apparently, this Mothman thing exists in West Virginia. So does the Bell Witch. Exactly. But it's like, it's convoluted about when things happen and what and what the body count's supposed to be. And it's just like, man, just shave off about 13% of this movie and you get a good movie. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I, I, I can't remember if I've seen this or not. It came out in 2002. Um, but you know, it's one of those that I'm getting, I'm probably getting confused with like butterfly effect or something like that. Yes. I know, I think I've seen this movie, but I don't remember a damn thing about it. Richard Gear, Nighttime Bridge, <laughs> Strange Phone Calls. Nighttime Bridge. <laughs> that's, that's movie. <laughs> um, it was directed by Mark Pellington, who is probably still best known as the dude who directed the Jeremy video for Pearl Jam. Oh, yeah. Oh. And, uh, he also did Arlington Road. Oh. Uh, but that's really the, the extent of his features is Mothman Prophecy and Arlington Road. There's a couple others sprinkled in. Um, Richard Gere and Laura Lenny, uh, reunite after Primal Fear. By that's right. Way. That's right. Uh, mm-hmm. then we have October Sky. Good movie. This is what, uh, this is Jake Gyllenhaal's, uh, big, uh, big jump off point, I mm-hmm. think. October Sky. Um, uh, bunch of kids make a rocket. It's, it's little kids good at math. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, and, and they, the, the, they don't, no adults believe in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they end up using math that basically they fire up a rocket. There's a fire. That destroys a building or a home. Mm-hmm. They get blamed, um, and they use math to eventually prove how there's no way it could have been their rocket. And then they go out and find their own goddamn rocket. They go out there and they're walking off the paces like they did all the GPS work before GPS existed. And they're like lunar, like drew, they took a line up to the moon, down to the earth, and, and they, the- they build it right. They build a rocket. Oh yeah, they built the rocket. Yeah. yeah, he ends up going to some rocket competition, and then like, we found out after the last time we talked about this in the podcast, he did go and work for NASA right. after this, right? Based on a true guy. Wow, math mm-hmm. always wins, baby. Mm-hmm. I need to watch this again. I, I mean, I saw it when it came out, um, and I remember you know the rocket and, and the the launching and the fires and the things. Yes, but uh, I forgot all that other stuff, like proving themselves. Yeah, it's math. like when we applaud a movie like The Martian. Um, for <clears throat> champion, championing, 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 championing <laughs> science. I got there first mm-hmm. try. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, that's, we only do that and not to October Sky because nobody saw October Sky. Mm-hmm. But it, it's if you want your kids to be like, yay, science, show them October Sky. Good mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. You know, Laura Dern has one of those careers that we're talking about, like Josh Brolin or something like that, where she's been almost sneaky underrated. Mm-hmm. For a long time, I think so. It's uh, it was. I mean, I know that Last Jedi might not be the movie to uh, uh, state this on, but I, I feel like it says something. It's a sort of a statement that she's sort of the ta da. She's the leader of this uh, this movie when they bring her in because mm-hmm. she's brought in like a legend. And I'm like, I was I was actually sitting there thinking, is she legendary at this point? And I'm and I and I. I think she might be. I think she. Might I think be. she is too. It's just that she doesn't have like a Meryl Streep uh, filmography. It's just that she's been constantly good. And uh, yeah, exactly. And she's. I mean, she did. She's in Jurassic Park and Citizen Ruth way back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that those were her first gigs, but even then, recently she's got the Last Jedi. She was in that movie, The Tale, on HBO, where she's mm-hmm. fan fucking tastic. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, I think she's a legend. I think she's earned that. Yeah, you look at her her rundown here. You got Alice doesn't live here anymore. You've got uh, Mask, interestingly enough. Uh, Blue Velvet. She, she was had, in Blue Velvet. She was probably six years old when she did Alice doesn't live here anymore. Oh, probably so. Yeah, she was born in '67. Uh, yeah, seven years old, right? Yeah, seven. Uh, Wild at Heart. God, I remember that yep. one. Yep, that was David Lynch too. Wasn't yep. It? Yeah. Yep. Uh, That's a crazy ass movie, of course. It is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jurassic Park, Rambling Rose, A Perfect World. Well, and she's much younger than you th- than you thought too, yeah. because when 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 I saw Jurassic Park, I was sixteen, and and Laura Dern seemed like she was in her thirties or whatever. That's how you think of age when you're sixteen. It's yeah. like, mm-hmm. oh, she had to be in her thirties or whatever. And then you go, you get to this age, and you look back. She was twenty six in yeah. twenty six yeah. in Jurassic Park. Yeah, I mean, uh, everything must go. She's in that. That's a really good one. Mm-hmm. The Master. She's fantastic. 
She's got a great scene in The Master, man, yeah. where where she starts questioning. I know you haven't seen this all the way through, right? Yeah. Go she's, ahead. There's a, it's towards the latter part of The Master, and things are slightly unraveling for uh, mm-hmm. for uh, the uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman character, but he's staging like this Sin Week or like convention nice. thing, like Scientology Week, and he's, he's debuting his new novel and all that. Yeah. And Laura Dern comes up to him. And, and she's this is like, right after he's read from the book, right? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's almost on a high, and then he comes down because he's done with getting that adulation and all that. And she's been one of his like strongest acolytes, right? She's made excuses for him mm-hmm. all the time. And she comes up to him in private. She's like, I had a question about your new book in relation to something that you said earlier. And he says something like, well, the words are perfect the way that I've written them. It's, yeah. just, a, it's just your interpretation. And she's like, she very politely, she's like, I just, I'm sorry, I just have one. And he erupts at her. Mm-hmm. And she has this shocked look. And you can tell her whole worldview has just been blown apart. Wow. And I don't think she's even seen for the rest of the movie. I think that's her last yeah. scene. And it's great. Mm. That's what. Anyway, that's Laura Dern. Laura Dern. <laughs> it's Laura Dern. Day. The Laura Dern podcast. <laughs> she's uh, she's going to be at uh, Molten Fest. Oh, yeah? Well, when this episode comes out, she will have already been. That's true. They actually got um, Catherine Keener, too. Oh, <laughs> oh no, wow. Dude. <laughs> and Alexander Payne. They're going to have all three of them there. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, next one. Uh, a movie that I don't think anybody saw when it came out, but it has become a cult hit. Silent Hill. Ooh. uh it is in the running for best video game movie adaptation it seems to pop up mm-hmm. is this by default like is it because there are really no good ones i think so i think because, probably both yeah i mean it's good i like it the yeah i think it's actually good um it's it's the, the atmosphere it mm-hmm. sets well, that's what the game was about, too. Yeah. That was one of the first games that was about, that I remember, that was about creepy atmosphere, mm-hmm. rather than necessarily, like, demon dogs attacking you every three seconds. Right. Mm-hmm. It was the fog and the shadow, and the, I played the game. I never saw the movie. Yeah. The game was creepy as hell. It was. I if stopped play it. playing yeah. <laughs> No, we actually, so my wife doesn't like uh, video game movies, and she doesn't really like horror movies. So I don't know how I convinced her to watch this, but we, we rented this one night, and i uh, shortly after it came out on demand and it was just really really good like Ooh. it was very well rada mitchell is the protagonist and she's fantastic in this and like you said the atmosphere in particular is perfect for for like a horror movie like this mm-hmm. where it's all like it's it's culty and stuff like that in the in the town and uh, it's not resident evil zombies coming after you type of thing even know? though to, to be fair the resident evil games scared the fuck out of me too yeah mm-hmm. don't play those at night by yourself yeah. oh yeah yeah um but uh it was uh, directed by christoph gans or gans who did uh brother brotherhood of the wolf that's something that some people may know him from um and he did a beauty and the beast that was french a few years ago uh but not that disney one but um <laughs> uh but roger avery wrote the screenplay and roger ah, avery yeah. was uh, part of pulp fiction mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. then we have superman 3 <laughs> what probably more famous in office space than it is an actual movie what is the reference in office space I that's forget. the the scheme that they do to oh, take the right. uh the, to take the fraction of a penny out of every transaction and put it in their own <laughs> is it, bank account is it uh, Lex Luthor back in this one doing this? No, uh, it's 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 uh it's Richard it's uh, Richard Pryor. Richard but- Pryor, he's a super genius like computer hacker, and he winds up either at the beginning or at the end or both working for a coal mine. So then, is it four that Gene Hackman comes back? Gene Hackman yeah. does come back in four. God, I've forgotten so much about these movies. Like I just know I remember my parents wouldn't let me watch this one when I was a kid. Oh really? Oh because Richard, Richard Pryor. Pryor. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then four was terrible. And so by the time I got around to watching three, it had a reputation already, and I didn't enjoy it. It's Shit, where, it's, I saw four in the theater. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's where the uh, Superman fights Clark Kent. <laughs> Do you, you remember this? <laughs> no. It, so Superman, it's almost like a. Does one of them say I can do this all day, and the other one say I know? <laughs> well, yeah. it's, it's almost like a like a Peter Parker changing the part in his hair to be like a badass emo Peter. Like, yep. like they Superman becomes an asshole, and somehow they get separated, and Clark has to fight Superman, who's asshole Superman. But now. Clark has no powers. He has powers too. That doesn't make sense. No, this fucking movie, dude. <laughs> <laughs> they fight and somehow end up like 
merging back together and then he goes and saves the world what's the west virginia part of this yes seriously it's the coal mine part uh Uh, where he either richard Pryor's character either starts off he definitely ends up working at a coal mine by the way this cannot be more of an 80s poster oh no kidding man (laughs) no fucking kidding that's animated um oh my god they had they had uh you know, it, the the first movie was Donner, and then the second one was supposed to be Donner, and they <laughs> fired him, and they hired Richard Lester, who was a you know hard days night guy and all that, and and uh, they they just went all in on the goofiness and went Superman three, you know they they let him stay on. It's almost the same kind of deal that you got with Joel Schumacher doing the Batman. Yeah, Richard Lester was uh, I don't know if he's. I guess he's a little bit more highly regarded than Joel Schumacher is, but you can see how a director a lot of times just sort of infests, or mm-hmm. I don't know if you want to say infests. That's maybe a little bit harsh, but uh, <laughs> you know, sort of uh, puts his stamp on some of these movies. Even mm-hmm. though you think some like Superman just gets made by the producers and like they to tell the director, you just do whatever you gotta, you do what we say and everything's good. But uh, they apparently found their man with Richard Lester. Like, I'm let's just make you, this man, goofy. This whole, I mean. Thank God Superman fans aren't as obsessed with canon as fucking Marvel fans or Star Wars fans or Star Trek fans, right? Because Superman movies done fucked up his character like <laughs> all kinds of ways. Oh, yeah. From reversing the, the, the world to having this weird, like, this type of kryptonite that doesn't work right away. It takes a while and then separates. It's just fucked up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, uh, bring on Nuclear Man. <laughs> yeah <laughs> isn't my that, eyes isn't that who he fights in the fourth one <laughs> the goggles do nothing i don't know oh, yeah i think that's man. what it is and then he ends up having to throw him in the sun or something i can't remember what it is <laughs> oh i thought you were talking it's, about that's it even if that's not it that's what it is <laughs> who was who was the simpsons character uh oh radioactive radioactive man. Man. the goggles do nothing <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part <laughs> It's like, what, is this safe? And they're like, yeah, that's what the goggles are for. And my favorite part is when he sees the acid coming down there, and he's completely unprotected, but he puts the goggles yeah. on. <laughs> uh, then we have We Are Marshall. This is a movie I never saw. Oh, um, it is every bit as average and good as any other football movie mm. ever was. Mm-hmm. So, if you liked Return of, Return of the Titans, if you liked Remember, <laughs> Revenge of the, Titans? Remember yes. the Friday Night Lights, <laughs> uh, this is just the uh, double Matt version of because it's Matty, Matty McConaughey mm-hmm. and Matty from Lost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matthew Fox. Um, and it's based on a true story at least in the sense that basically all all but a few people of the football team were killed in a plane crash um and this guy comes in as a new coach with a bunch of new athletes who most of them have never been athletes and creates this team Mm -hmm. goes to learn the veer which is basically oh that's right yeah (laughs) like a uh, toss sweep or something yeah Yeah, it's basically like the keep or the third whatever what do they call it these days the option Oh yeah, option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's 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 like the Godfather of the option. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But do they new... call it the Veer in that? In yeah. the movie, they do. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We're gonna learn the Veer. He goes to the only school that does it and asks the coach outright, "Will you teach me how?" And that guy's like, "Okay." That guy's basically Jesus in this movie because <laughs> he does that, and then he donates free uniforms and helmets and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. and they're like in the same division and shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then they go on and win a bunch of games and blow everybody's mind and kick ass and you know it's every bit as good or average as any of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he goes to West Virginia University, I think, uh, right up the the road, basically. Yeah. and I think he's the guy that uh, that takes care of all that stuff. But yeah, the Veer, it's uh, the triple op, triple option, triple option. Yeah. yeah, I imagine there'll be a day where we get uh, a movie about the Humboldt Broncos, the the yeah. hockey team yeah. that did that, that that had the uh, bus drive. Uh, was it the bus? It was a bus, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, always a little weirded out when they make movies uh, on this topic, you know, because it's you kind of I don't know. I guess I guess you, you can't really draw a line unless it's just so fresh or whatever that that marshall yeah. thing had happened many years yeah, before. it was in the 70s yeah yeah this one i think it's because i don't think they even show the crash or anything oh, like they that. do they do yeah well they show 
pretty sure they show wreckage. It's more of the aftermath. Like uh, that's definitely early on in the yes. movie. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's more of the aftermath and how you rebuild. Yeah, and all it's that like stuff. the first 10, 15 minutes, plane crash, and then it's like one year later or mm-hmm. whatever, and Matthew McConaughey's getting hung. So mm-hmm. yeah. I liked it. I just can't like say you're gonna love it. Right? Yeah. No, and it's I I enjoyed it too. But you know, it's one of those that doesn't have like a happy happy saccharine ending. It has the actual like realistic ending where they don't win their first game of the season, but they do end up winning like a closely fought game with a with a similarly not good team. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, yay, rah, we win the division. It's just like, we won a game. It does have one good moment I remember sticking out where one of the players who survived, wasn't on the plane, had bought this like 12 pack of beers mm. with his roommates who had been on the plane and died. And it became like this thing where he couldn't touch them. He couldn't drink them. And he just kind of set it over in the corner and didn't think about it. Um, and then later, once the team is now gelling and coming together under Matty M and they're starting to bond, a couple of his new friends and roommates walk into his room, casually open the 12 pack and toss him one. Mm-hmm. And he kind of like, I'm going to grow and opens the beer and drinks it with them. Yeah, really yeah. cool moment. Yeah, yeah. But again, the movie's pretty average. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Uh, then we have Win a Date with Tad Hamilton. Oh, God. Never saw it. <laughs> um, I um. did. Um, all I, I think it's basically like Topher Grace is, is in love with Kate Bosworth. Mm-hmm. Kate Bosworth get, I, I don't know if it was this an actual contest in the movie mm-hmm. or like. Yeah, she, he's, he's trying to upgrade his image. Okay. And it's Josh Dumel mm-hmm. who's playing uh, Tad Hamilton in this. So it's Kate Bosworth and uh and josh dumel while topher grace is like you know secretly pining over in the corner somewhere and perfect name though man yeah tad? <laughs> i never i knew one tad and he was exactly what this guy sounds like oh like, really s- snooty like i wear better clothes than you my dad makes <laughs> lots of money tad my <laughs> name was tad it was a 90s man called tad that was based on a guy who was apparently obese bald and was prone to stripping at uh, grunge shows. And he's a, a cult classic. Huh. Everyone in Seattle knows and loves this guy. I was going to make a Tad the Wet Sprocket joke. No! But now oh, like, damn. <laughs> now I feel like it's out of place. Uh, this is a, a one of those sneaky great casts that came out of nowhere on this mm-hmm. movie. Nathan Lane, Sean Hayes, Gary Cole, Jennifer Goodwin, Catherine Hahn, Octavia Spencer, Amy Smart. Jesus. <laughs> Stephen Tobolowski's in it um did you say you'd seen this yeah i saw it when it came out did you like it at all i back in this day for whatever reason like all these stupid romantic comedies that came out i loved them Mm -hmm. uh this um uh in good company um uh what was the uh, you went right to another toe for grace yeah went right to that cooper uh i love you beth cooper Cooper. um uh what was the other one oh uh uh, she's out of my league or whatever Mm -hmm. it is or or is that what it's called the mm-hmm. one with uh, uh, Jay Baruchel. Yeah, that's, she's out, she's of, out of my league. I, I keep I get that confused with that. There's that movie that came out with Tony Danza in the 80s called She's Out of Control. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we remember that show. <laughs> and so when I say she's out of my league, I'm like, am I confusing it with that Tony Danza movie? Um, then we have... Is uh, Kate Bosworth the one with the two different Two different eyes. color eyes, yeah. What, what's, uh, what's going on with her these days? Uh, I don't know. Just like a lot of actresses that come up and they're really pretty and everything that she was the next go, you know, she was the next big thing. And I even remember entertainment weekly had her on the cover. Uh, and, and, uh, it said something like, is Kate Bosworth the next big thing? And I think it was right after blue crush Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the next week in the mail section, uh, someone repeated that. Is Kate Bosworth the next big thing? And she and the guy goes, "No." <laughs> <laughs> That's mean. It's really mean. Uh, <laughs> it's super mean. And uh, but like, yeah, she's only been in like direct to video, direct to Netflix. Well, yeah, I mean, and occasionally you'll you'll see you'll hear about a movie that she's in or whatever. But yeah, it it does show that a lot of times. Uh, you just gotta have that weird mix of luck and and mm. whatever to get to become really big, and uh, it goes back to that stuff that they talk about in *The Star Is Born*, right? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, some people some people have it and just can't, just don't get famous, and some people have it and they have that just that right mix. Mm-hmm. Well, and some people like okay, so I was watching *Shocker*. I was watching a Friends episode on on TV today <laughs> and noticed 
that one of the guest c- characters was uh, who was the director of this movie Joey's auditioning for, mm-hmm. and, he, and he wants to do a nude scene, but he needs an authentic person who's not circumcised. So Monica helps Joey make a, a lunch meat uh, <laughs> pe- penis edition. <laughs> oh, I've oh, totally oh, missed this so episode. <laughs> he drops trout in front of the director to prove he's got foreskin and you get the angle from behind and the lunch meat falls oh, no. to the ground <laughs> and, and joey goes that's never happened before <laughs> anyway the, the guy playing the director is the voice of baymax who oh was that that that's uh C2 scott adds it yeah and i was like oh, yeah. i know i've seen this guy in plenty of places i look it up i didn't recognize his name you did because you have a better brain than i do but that dude has like Two, three hundred credits on IMDb. Really? Like, all the way back to, like, the Friends Seinfeld era. Wow. He's in shit. He's in Gilmore Girls, I think, for, like, a half a season. Mm-hmm. He's He works. That guy was works, on, um, but he's not famous. I think the first time I ever saw him was on Mr. Show. I think Mr. Show was one place he was on. And then uh, 30 Rock, he was a, sort, of, sort of a mainstay on that. He's, I looked him up at uh, on uh, on Wikipedia, and he was at, it's either Second City or the other Chicago famous comedy troupe. But wherever Tina Fey Upright was. Upright Citizens, okay, maybe. So it was Second City then. Well, but, I, I, I don't know which one it was. Uh, Improv Olympics is the but other But he one. was at the one Tina Fey was at the same time she was there. He oh, just yeah. well, She well. went on to Plume, and he's more of a character actor, but uh, that guy's not hurting for work. But he's not. But he's not famous. I think that's fascinating. People in the industry probably know that guy really well. Oh yeah, Tina Fey may send him birthday cards. (laughs) He just doesn't have the same level of fame. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let me see. I'm looking this up real quick. Yeah, he he was Chicago Second City. Okay. Um. Uh. That was an interesting uh moment, by the way, that C two E two because. It, you you realize like what does the perception other people have of you a lot of times we were there to be in that room with a, a bunch of adoring fans and uh and we thought well i guess there must be some sort of waiting area somewhere that we should go to and we and scott adds it's there he had just finished his panel and his agent is there and then maybe somebody from a media or something like that and uh we're like looking for like this waiting room or whatever with there, there was none. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that agent was like, what are these people doing? What, are they do- what, what's going on? Like, and, and we thought we were looking for a waiting room and they're like, that, she's like, that's not a waiting room. <laughs> like, like very serious about like, just, you know, I'm going to protect my client. I'm going to make sure you're not some crazy people. Cause he was, uh, he was doing the big hero six, yeah. like, uh, a big, big hero six thing. Yeah. Um, then we have uh, ending uh, the main list. Wrong turn, Ooh! and all of the sequels. Oh, I've seen. I've the, seen the first one. I've seen the fourth one. I think it's the fourth one. I've seen more than any of them. Have you seen all of them though? Uh, yes, but I've only seen the first one once. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. am, the, the first one is kind of like decent, it's watchable. Right? Yeah, it's totally yeah. watchable. Yeah, but the, it, I don't like watchable. I like bad. <laughs> I like bad. Um, and it just they just get increasingly worse. One of them's like a prequel. Uh, the one inside the uh, the insane asylum hospital, that's my favorite. Whichever one that is, I've seen that one a bunch. <laughs> it's like snowy outside, and they're like trapped in a blizzard so they go into this like abandoned quote unquote they take a wrong turn wait, 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 yeah let me ask you something do they take a wrong turn in every one of these wrong turns oh no no i don't even think going to the hospital is a wrong turn yeah it's the first one they take a wrong turn they've just decided to take the title yes and but the cannibal killers are still the same uh, okay so the basically oh, yeah, these yeah. inbred cannibal family uh usually fathers and sons who who kill people and then the prequel one they go back it's like their ancestors oh nice yeah i love these movies. Near, <laughs> nearly all of these movies are a hybrid of texas chainsaw massacre and evil dead mm. uh there was a ton of these cabin fever came out the same time uh wrong turn and then there was house of wax yeah there's just a million of these um and it's always like i i started to because because i'm from the south I started to get a little offended by these movies <laughs> because all of them were redneck horror movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, the High Tension was another one that kind of oh, yeah. fell under that, too. Um, because, you know, it's always about this idea that if you if you get away from civilization, then there's after that, there's nothing but 
people who want to kill and eat you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and the hills have eyes. Another one. Yep. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the, 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 the they, they're going to West Virginia, which I think is like one, of, it's one of the classic states that you refer to as far as people inbreeding and crap like that, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. It's one of the go to mm-hmm. states. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you can substitute almost any Southern state in that. And, you know, mm-hmm. people have said that with Alabama and Tennessee yep. and whatever, Arkansas. But, uh, but yeah, I had started to get a little offended by that. I was like, you know, I, I agree. I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to get turned the wrong way somewhere, <laughs> you know, uh, in one of these areas and not have access to phones and stuff like that. But, but I, the, the, it's, there's a subtext to this that all of these, all the people that you encounter are killers or backwards or, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, it's not like you knock on the the farm door and they're waiting for you with a like a freshly baked pie. Yeah, yeah, like that, yeah. like Newman's. Well, and, and, and <laughs> if, if they're not killers, they're in on it. Like they're yeah. like they you know like they they go to the gas station or whatever, and the gas station guy, you know, like in Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, you know, like, all right, well they're coming in just uh, on schedule and everything. Uh, but yeah, the, these are. I mean, aside from that, these are silly enough, and oh, yeah. innocuous enough movies. Yeah, when did they start showing titties and stuff? Was it the first one? Uh, I think it's nudity in all of them. I think well, because yeah. it's Emmanuel Shikri and uh, and uh, Eliza Dushku. Eliza Dushku in the first no. one. And then, well, there's and another then, chick. What? I think there's another chick in there. There's, there in may wrong, not be any in the first wrong turn. In, in the first one, but they get they get super titty uh, <laughs> in the <laughs> in the titty, titty like delicious. Trying, I feel like you're trying to put words in my mouth. No, I don't. They get more nude. T- t- more. They include more nudity. As I don't the think so. Goes no, I think they include more sleaze. More, oh. I think the angles are tighter on the outfits are skimpier. Oh, so it's almost implied nudity. Yes. There's a, uh, there's a, is, that's kind of what I like about it. God, yeah. I'm going to look like, I'm going to look terrible. I'd I rather the titty have question. that than nudity <laughs> any day of the week, man. Um, You'd rather have the implied yeah. than actual nudity? Why? Once you go all the way to nudity, there's no more suspense. <laughs> Mm. There's nothing. There's nothing to keep me on the edge mm. of my seat, and that's why. <laughs> yeah, if we you, just cracked the case of why you I, watch these. The movies. idea that <laughs> the idea that they might is more than what they now, do. Now this may maybe someone could have a field day with like my Puritan upbringing as a preacher's kid and what that has done to my sexuality as an adult. I don't know. Interesting. But in general, I'm not saying I don't like nudity. I'm just saying. I am. I have more fun when it's about to be nudity than I do once we get there. Wow! Back. Wow! There's well, a well. So softcore is up. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Stop. yes. Stop. 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 <laughs> um. There's another girl in there named Lindy Booth who might be the one who you know provides nudity in this mm, might but, be but uh emmanuel shrieky and uh and uh and eliza dushku are the main ones and then uh you remember last week we we're like where's jeremy sisto he was in this too yeah, i like was. jeremy sisto yeah, oh he was. was really good in six feet under mm, yeah remember yeah, he was. him in six feet Under. everybody was really good in that show i just never liked that show do you never like that show i mean really? i liked elements of that show i'm uh-huh. saying the cult following that loves that show like it's better than the sopranos i never understood yeah. that yeah but you're right all the individual characters are fantastic that's what i was show. yeah and i watched it i watched the whole show yeah but i was watching it more for the acting than because i was i wasn't connected to any of those characters those are all pretty terrible people they <laughs> except, are pretty except terrible. for michael c hall he's pretty decent yeah barely <laughs> yeah there was a there was a uh i know i remember jeremy sisto on one of the punked episodes too because oh, yeah. they were arresting him and uh the arresting officer was like was like uh i don't know if how it happened but somehow it came up that he was an actor in the the whole shakedown and everything and they're like well w- okay what have you been in and so jeremy sisto starts running down basically what his imdb is you know <laughs> like i was in a movie called clueless i was in a movie called this i was in a movie that um <laughs> uh then on the uh secondary list we have dear wendy i've never seen this lars von trier that's it's a it's a lars von trier written movie it's got bill pullman and allison pill in it that's all i know it's a west virginia small mining town i've just never seen lars von trier as a writer on something that he's not directing i'm sure it's happened on other things Mm -hmm. then there's a movie called heroin with the e in parentheses so i guess it's trying to be both uh female hero and about drugs mm. um, yeah. 
uh, but it's about the opioid de- epidemic. Yeah, it's a it's a documentary. It was nominated for an Oscar, actually. Oh, really? Um, yeah, man. Every every show that you see, every documentary that you see about West Virginia is unfortunately about the opioid epidemic. Like that's, I mean, I don't even know how you get around up there because they've they've got to have them in like bowls or something like yeah. that. I don't mean to make light of it, but like, there's just so much of that shit yeah. out there. Yeah, I wouldn't know where to find it in the metropolitan area no i wouldn't either i'm not looking for it yeah mr nsa eavesdrop it on the show mm-hmm. by the way speaking of documentaries i watched the hardest to watch documentary of my life Ooh, on hbo it's about the larry nasser gymnastics oh my oh. god it's called they made a the heart of gold really and it is it's interviews but it's probably 40 percent footage of each of the victims chewing him out in court and Mm. Mm. The, the the detail is disgusting and disturbing but then you hear about like they're interviewing mom right alongside daughter and oh, my mom was like i was in the room i was wow. on the other side of the screen i never thought anything was going on and then there's all the people that covered up for his ass um oh. it was harder for me to watch than the michael jackson documentary mm. wow would you recommend it i know that's kind of weird only on a moral scale like is it sad? Those those testimonials is that enough satisfaction? I say that in quotes, like to to make it watchable. We I've, all know the story. Well, that's the thing. I I feel like I thought I knew the story, and then I watched the documentary, and I feel like it was so much worse than what I okay. thought I knew. In that case, I'd, I'd probably so check from it like out. a from a importance standpoint, yes, I would recommend. But I if if anyone is is anyone listening. If you've been a victim, this is probably not the movie for you. Um, and if you are close to someone who's been a victim, like read up, do some due diligence to, beyond just my own words. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, 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 it was very hard to watch, but I am ultimately glad on the other side that I watched. Mm. Yeah. Uh, then we have Matuwan, which is uh, John Sayles wrote, wrote and directed this movie. Surprisingly, I've never seen it, and I love John Sayles. Yeah, right. Um, uh, it's got a 7.9 on the IMDb, and it's about uh, labor unions in the mining community. Um, it's got Chris Cooper, uh, who I didn't know existed before 1990. Uh, <laughs> well, I believe this is his first movie. Is it? Yeah, it's his film debut. Oh, this. wow. And uh, James Earl Jones, Mary McDonald's in it. You haven't seen this? Mm-mm. You? He did Lone Star, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I know, I've seen you all and he Lone did, Star. Uh, he did Eight Men Out. Eight Men Out is great. Oh, shit, I forgot that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really want to see this. Well, he must have done Eight Men Out like right after he did Motto on then. It uh, was pretty quick. Yeah, it had to have been right after. And then uh, David Strathairn's in this as well. Um, this is a movie that I know I've heard the name of, but I have never seen it, <laughs> and now I'm going to have to watch it. David Strathairn basically is Chris Cooper, though, right? He kind of is. Where you heard it before was the Star Wars prequels, because because oh. Liam Neeson took a Matawan learner. He, that's <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. He he kept calling him Young Matawan. <laughs> <laughs> like, why are you talking about a John Sayles movie? Right. And and then I just I just you know I just brushed it aside and I was like ah, it's just George Lucas being weird. <laughs> um, and then finally Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Ooh, that's the good shit. Yeah, is it really? I, I can't believe. I think I've seen parts of this movie before, but I can't believe that I haven't seen it. The only the only drawback for me, and this is very selfish, is. It is every bit as bloody and gory as a regular horror movie. Mm -hmm. So there are people in my life that would enjoy the humor, but would be turned off by the gore that I cannot recommend this to. Like there's a there's a wood chipper in this movie that I think will stay with you longer than the Fargo wood chipper. Yep. (laughs) Um, It's just funny as fuck. I wish they'd make another one or at least reteam and do more of this horror comedy thing. Uh, it's just it's it's fucking great yeah this is a fun movie i saw this when it came out i have not seen it since but i do remember this being fun and good and uh but alan tudyk and uh tyler labine uh are the tucker and dale mm-hmm. of the movie and then you have katrina bowden um in this as well bunch of sexy hot young people go out to a cabin and they believe tucker and dale are redneck murder killers when really tucker and dale are in every instance trying to be helpful and friendly and it just it's through misunderstandings 
that the teens continue to think Tucker and Dale are the killers and that all the deaths are accidental. Mm. <laughs> um, and it just, it just keeps spiraling on top of itself. Oh uh, yeah. That's right up my hilarious. alley. Yeah. 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 yeah it's pretty, it's, it's pretty great. Um, and that does it for West Virginia. Wow. Um, barely knew you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, obviously we'll have, uh, some bigger ones for Wisconsin, uh, but then Wyoming will be another sparse state. Yeah, yeah. Although it'll have a lot of Westerns, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that does it for West Virginia. Okay. So, uh, what are we going to do now? We're going to do some, uh, recommends and warrants. Let's do it. We've been backed up on these, right? And then we'll, we'll try to get in some questions. We're backed up on those two. Totes amaze balls. They're great. It won the Academy Award. Oh, for what? For best movie ever made. Uh, okay, uh, I've got I've got to recommend um, the the group that I watch movies with once every month. I was wanted to watch the original Wicker Man, and I wanted to watch a movie called the 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 Devils, uh, which through some labyrinthian uh, uh, rights thing is unavailable anywhere. You wow. can't buy it. You can't stream it. The Devils or the, the, Wicker, devils, the Devils? The Wicker Man I bought. Um, but uh, The Devils is uh, is a movie that uh, I, I'm not going. I'm not recommending it because I didn't see it. Mm. Um, but uh, it was one of those weird things where it was on that. It was on that. Uh, I think it was on Filmstruck, and then it went out, and Criterion basically started their own thing. But through all of that, the that there was no translation of The Devils going from that service to the criterion hmm. so it's now it's in limbo somewhere i guess so uh, i had to come up with a movie i hadn't seen that sort of fit the weird horror motif that i was trying to set and uh ended up on a movie called don't look now uh with donald sutherland and julie christie it's a nicholas rogue movie huh. and uh it is probably best known to some of you out there as a movie where they wondered whether or not Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie actually had sex on Mm. film. Uh, There's even a story from a producer on the set who came on and was like, I can see his dick going in and out of her. Oh, (laughs) Um, all right. My kind of movie. (laughs) But everybody else who was on that set was like, that guy is fucking ridiculous. There's no way that was happening. Um, Don't look now has sort of the, uh, kind of an opening premise premise similar to um uh antichrist Mm, uh mm. the sutherland and christie are uh are looking at some photo photographs of this uh of this place that he's gonna it's it's a place in uh venice that he's gonna go and help restore and uh they're sitting there taking a look at pictures and everything meanwhile their daughter is outside playing with another kid and uh i think it's their brother actually uh and i don't remember exactly and i think this is how the movie cuts it you don't know exactly what happened but she drowns in a river mm. and he, he the the brother's running towards the house and donald sutherland runs out and tries to save her pulls her out of the water and it's too late uh so based on on this kind of like uh, tragedy they they now have to go to venice and do all this work and everything and uh christy who plays uh laura baxter in this um runs into a uh a blind woman who has uh psychic powers and she thinks that she can talk to her dead daughter Hmm. and so the movie is very strange though it feel it's not as ghost story as you think it might be with that premise and Hmm. everything it's really about this couple trying to sort of like uh the the people who make these predictions the woman who makes this prediction says you need to get out of here this is not a safe place for you in venice and everything meanwhile they they throw in this other wrinkle there's someone going around town stabbing people and throwing them in the river and everything so hmm. there's like this that there's this mixture of the you know sutherland and christie think they see their daughter at times they think it's a ghost or something but you know, it's not it's not really about that um and uh there there's uh there's this killer and then there's also this you know the stuff that's happening while he's renovating this thing and it's impossible to like tell you how good this movie is Mm. because it it's really that basic and but there's a lot of things that happen in it that i don't really want to spoil either Hmm. um but it's a movie i've heard about forever 
and finally saw it and that was it was really good it was cool. really good don't look now all right um, check that out uh 70s it, it came movie. out in 1973 yeah it's it's one of those movies that it you know it, it talking about it doesn't sound like it's super exciting but it's it's really well done mm-hmm. it's atmospheric and uh, you've got those two actors at the forefront mm-hmm. and it's really good so Woo. All right, good recommend. Mm-hmm. What you got? You me 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 me. Yeah, go ahead. Me 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 me. You. Yeah. Let's talk about blind spotting. <clears throat> All right. All right. Blind spotting is my new lock. Ooh. <clears throat> okay. Ooh. It's nothing like lock. Right. What I mean by that is, I didn't know anything about it. It came out of nowhere for me, and I was fucking riveted. Mm. And now I want everyone I know to watch it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I've bought it. It's on. It's going to be delivered to my house today for my wife to watch. Uh, I know I heard Chris say he's got a copy in another room. One of y'all better watch that shit. I've seen it four times now. Holy shit. Uh, in three days, four days. And the first time through, I was riveted. It's just it's so kinetic. And it's not like anything I've ever seen. And I'll explain more in a second. The second time through, I saw all the Oakland subtext and background shit and how important it was for this specific movie to be set in oakland um the third time through i started noticing different acting performances that stood out to me and the fourth time through i was just riveted again Mm. this is about a guy who's three days away from getting off probation um he's been in jail he's in jail because he was a bouncer at a bar and somebody got lippy and he shoved him and it started a fight and basically that guy ended up in the hospital Mm. So this guy, Colin, it's David Diggs, who you might know from Blackish. Um, yeah, what else? He's also, he and, the, he and the guy that plays Miles, his best friend, who's white, uh, they wrote this, and they've been working on this for 10 years, uh, and it shows. Um, so his friend Miles is white, but talks like he's black, and everyone around seems okay with it. Um, <laughs> but he's okay. stupid, and he always gets in trouble and gets in fights. And so Colin has to be extra wary for three more days and then he'll be off probation. He'll be free. He can, can move out of the probation house he's staying in uh, and, and he can move on and, and do what he wants. He was in Hamilton. David yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, was okay, in Hamilton. That's why he was I in the original cast. Too. I think the original cast yeah, of yeah, Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it's not surprising because mm-hmm. uh, this guy can rap. Um, and so throughout the movie, there are scenes where he and Miles will lightly rap. Mm. So that's like they're movers. And so they get a job they go to an address and they find out what they're loading in the truck and where they're taking it they get to one house and it's basically a hoarder house Hmm. and the lady says just empty it i don't care what you do with any of it here's the keys and she leaves and so they go in and they're like kind of lightly rapping not even about what they're looking at as they're picking through the stuff just about their situations and Hmm. uh, how hard it is to live in oakland and it it kind of becomes this thing where you're not quite sure if it's a stylistic choice or if we're supposed to think these characters are actually rapping. Huh. And ultimately, like that's how they communicate at some points. Yeah, ultimately the movie does say they are rapping. Mm. Uh, the characters are. Uh, but it plays for the first few scenes like maybe this is just the way they talk because they, they're wannabe musicians, or maybe this is what the director had told them told him to do for stylistic reasons. Um, so he's got this girl that he wants to see. She works for the same moving company. She's the dispatcher. Uh, and his white friend has a girlfriend and a kid. And it's basically Colin sees a black kid get gunned down by a cop. He's driving the moving truck at night, stopped at a stoplight. Black kid runs by, white cop runs by, shoots him dead. Hmm. And he starts having uh, PTSD, starts having visions when he's jogging of dead black people in the cemetery. Um, He starts, uh, he has a a vivid dream where he's in court being on trial for not having stopped that murder. Um, And things start to bubble with him and his white friend where he eventually says, you're, you're, you're white. You know, call me the N-word. Hmm. You've done it your whole life. Let me hear you do it right now. He's like, I don't want to do it. And he's like, well, if it's okay if I call you the N-word, why isn't it okay for you to call me the N-word? And hmm. they basically have this huge fight. God, I love this movie so much. Anyway, that's all I really want to say. It ends with a scene where they stumble on something they didn't expect to. And he raps for about five minutes. I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it. It's the most emotionally raw and he just spills it all out about wow. how how fucking hard it is uh, to be a black guy in America, essentially. But for him specifically in Oakland, um, God, I 
am riveted. I, there's a YouTube video of just that last four minutes and 45 seconds of him doing the rap. Mm. I've watched that a dozen times. Jesus Christ. Um, I need to see this movie I, like now. I like I, I sent Josh Childs last night. I sent him an email. I was like, you need to watch this because Josh had a movie idea that I don't want to spoil because I don't want somebody to steal it. And this is the first movie that ever made me think Josh's idea he had in college could work visually. God, I love this movie. Wow. I cannot recommend this movie enough. Josh wrote me back and said, is it, is it going to be like Whiplash, where it's just okay for the whole movie and then the ending's awesome? <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. And I what said, the fuck kind of comment is that? I said, somebody clearly oversold Whiplash to you <laughs> and ruined your experience. <laughs> oh, but this is that. good the whole way through. Um, great performances, great humor, and they, the two leads play off each other so well because in real life they're best friends who, I'm, from what I understand, grew up together in Oakland. I knew nothing about this movie, just like you. Oh, God. And this makes me definitely want to see it. What? If I had heard something like that, I would have I would have been it right there. It came on, I, I was flipping channels and I saw it on Cinemax and I went to Dicer on Twitter DM and I said, is Blind Spot? And that's one of those movies you said I need to see, right? And he was like, yes. I was like, okay. That was literally all I knew. And uh, you didn't even realize the Hamilton connection. No, no. Wow. I didn't know who any of these people were. That's uh, is something about that style that's right up your alley. Actually, Ethan Embry is in this movie. Really? From That Thing You Do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he looks, I've, again, seen the movie four times, still can't really tell looking that it's Ethan Embry. Wow. He's aged that much. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. sudden Tom Everett Scott and uh, La La Land. Except, that, except in that, he looked like Tom Everett Scott. That's and true. here, like, I can't even see Ethan Embry in this guy's face when I look at it. But wow. he's, he's the only name in it that I knew going in. Anyway, wow. yeah, watch it. Watch it. If you, if you don't like it, I will probably wait six months before I recommend another movie. To you. <laughs> I, will, I will put myself in recommendation prison. I'll probably watch it this afternoon. Oh, wow. That's, that was, that now, is a that, when you do throat. watch it, no rush. I do want to know what you think. Okay. I'm going to do like a double thing real quick, because you guys have been talking about Veep for ages, in mm -hmm. 2012. Mm -hmm. I don't know when you started watching. Mm -hmm. I've watched episodes of this, mm -hmm. out of order, sequentially, but just when it came on, so I didn't have any real context. The humor was great, though. The humor was awesome. I laughed along to it and everything, but I started just kind of watching it when I was sick, uh, in the early parts of it. I just I was like, I need something to binge, mm -hmm. and so... I started binging the first season, and I I can't believe it took me this long to get mm. on board. It's like Silicon Valley when I finally came around to that too, um, in a very very different way. But I this this show makes me laugh out loud like constantly. Yep, and I never laugh out loud anyway. So uh, that, that's me coming around on things way too late as normal. I've actually recommended this before. I I don't know if we recommended this Double before. Down. We talked about it. Double we down. talked about Suspiria, the last year's remake. Oh, right? yeah, that's my favorite Phil Collins song. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you had a chance to watch this, by the way? <laughs> no. I got this in studio. Uh, okay. So have you watched it again? Not since, no. Okay. Both of us walked out of that uh, theater saying, I don't know really what we just saw. We liked it, mm -hmm. but I don't know really what we just saw. Yep. Having that context... And knowing the the general structure of the story, I was able to watch it in a much more like I don't know I, I focused or, or understanding way, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I got the story, and the story I think is fairly straightforward. There's just so much stuff all over it that it that it that it's hard to get to the 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 root of. And it's awesome. This is like gone up in my estimation. It was like an A minus. Maybe this is an A plus now. Ooh. And I watched this again. My non horror movie loving wife watched this. Watched this with me, and she was floored. I'm kind of shocked that she liked it. Actually, I was too. I, yeah, I, the only reason I haven't watched this yet is because all the vibes I've gotten, even from people that like it, is that this is not a Jeremy movie. I it's, don't think oh, I would like it. If what is holding you back is gruesomeness. There's only, there's very little overt gruesomeness. No, what's holding me back is Twin Peaksness. No. Well, okay. 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 <laughs> it's not that. I hear what you're saying. It's not that. I don't want to spend 2 hours and walk out and literally know nothing that just happened. Okay. <sighs> I'm, I'm sorry. trying No, no, no. I'm trying to explain this because when you have like a clearer view of it, when you watch it, say, a second time or something like that, not that I'm recommending a movie that you have to watch two times to get, no. but it's also like kind of like us, right? Yeah. Like you can think about it and you could probably just kind of meander your way to where you think well, see, the story is going to Okay, I would clarify by saying I know a bunch of stuff that happened in Us. Right, I don't know right, right. everything. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah. questions, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I don't. 
Like Twin Peaks has never appealed to me. anything like that. It's not. It's in between us and Twin Peaks. Okay. All right. Then I, I as far as as far as symbolism, as far as like metaphysical stuff and things like that. All right. Uh, it's it's a story about a coven of witches. It comes out very clearly and says that disguised as a dance studio, and it's all the other stuff, the visual flair and all that stuff that I think makes it gorgeous to watch. Mm -hmm. But when you pay attention to the story a little bit more, like I did this time. It, it rewards you very much, and you still enjoy the imagery and all that stuff, too. So that is my full-throated recommendation to really anybody, anybody that's not into horror. Yes, there's a couple of disturbing images, um, but then, God, there's just so much great stuff that buttresses it. Buttresses it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> buttresses um. Yeah. Okay, so uh on to warns. Um we were uh we were doing a a a live thing for our patrons uh last week and I I mentioned that I had seen Holmes and Watson and I saw Happy Time Murders. Hmm. <laughs> Both of them are bad. Happy Time Murders is probably 10 times worse than Holmes and Watson. Um Happy Time Murders is a movie that I really, when I first saw a trailer for it, I was so excited about it. Yeah. Um, and I know that not everybody was, and obviously uh, the trailers did not translate into this being a hit, and then bad reviews definitely contributed to this not doing anything. Um, but Happy Time Murders is one of those movies that I, I, sit, I have to sit back. It's so bad in its execution that it's actually interesting to watch mm. because you want to figure out exactly like you could study this movie on how not to do comedy i think mm -hmm. um the the i think the first problem comes from the fact that the puppets that are in this are all quote unquote human uh there's no characters there's no like there's not a frog there's not a miss piggy there's not a fozzy bear they're like there's oh, they're human puppets yeah right? they're just yeah. they're just they're humans in puppet form mm. they have uh, a couple of things that they put in there like that puppets have that humans don't have like they have uh, a liver that can drink all the alcohol that you can possibly drink and stuff like that um but uh you know, I, I think Brian Henson, uh, Jim Henson's son, had had carried that mantle for a while, was doing pretty good work with the the, the Jim Stu Henson Studios and all that. And he decided, I want to do a dirty one because I'm sure they've all had, you know, Kermit the Frog and Fozzie Bear say curse words and stuff mm -hmm. like that when they've been when, when they've been going about things. But I think the problem with this movie is that every bit of humor in this is some sex joke is someone saying a, a curse word is drug related there's no lines in this there's nothing about it that just is funny on its own everything about it is you're gonna laugh because this is a puppet saying these things mm. and the problem too is just the fact that they're all humans so there's really no difference in your head really yeah but when they're when they're doing all this stuff there's no difference between this person and you say put paul rudd in there and mm. and he says these same lines so it's uh so it, you know it's it's one of those movies that's actually like i would never recommend you to watch this movie for entertainment <laughs> i would recommend you to watch this movie to figure out what's not funny about <laughs> it um and even in the outtakes and they they apparently are having a grand old time making this movie <laughs> uh they're in the outtakes like all the outtakes have that same humor to it and they're dying at it they must think that they're the fun this is the funniest thing ever made because oh. uh there's a point where uh the main uh the main act the main puppet is at a bar and like he orders some drinks or whatever this is in the outtakes and then he says something like hey anybody got any coke around here and everybody's like you hear the ha, 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 in the background <laughs> and it's like hmm. it, it, there, <laughs> it, just because it's a puppet saying it doesn't make it funny and that's i guess that's the entire premise right pretty much and the, i mean the the story premise is flimsy i mean as flimsy as it gets uh uh there's this there's this old show from the 80s that's about to have a reunion and uh and it's i think it's called happy time mm. uh all of the puppets that were involved with that show 
are are getting killed and they find out that there's a clause in the contract that says that uh whoever's left out of if if there's like these deaths start get start splitting up the uh remaining like royalty checks or something like that so like um so after a few of them it's like okay who in this cast could possibly be benefiting from all of this and it's sort of like that who done it type of thing but you know in the trailer you had that that scene that you know got some people you know and, and i thought it was funny too in the in trailer form when you watch it in the movie it's like when he's when he's like ha- you know having an orgasm and it's like all this silly string is just coming out <laughs> constantly <laughs> and every was fucking hilarious yeah, it's in hilarious in the trailer and then the by of course in the movie you've seen it already that's one strike against it and then it just keeps going and going and going oh yeah, wow and um and so yeah every single joke in this is based on well you're gonna laugh because it's puppets so Man, brian henson directed that he did Jeez. uh it's got a it currently a 5.3 on the imdb which sounds low but it's way too high for this yeah i bet the rotten tomatoes is like an 18 <laughs> yeah it's 23 okay 23. So only off by five percent yeah, 5%. yeah. I mean, and all your all of your humans that are in this melissa mccarthy tries her best to try to make this funny she has that one mildly humorous thing where she's um she's the former partner of the guy the detective the main detective and um and she has that part where she's like uh doing the she sniff snorting the like um pixie dust or whatever mm. and the guy's like uh i fuck you or whatever and she's like maybe maybe or something <laughs> or whatever later or whatever uh there's a couple of those moments in there but yeah yeah melissa mccarthy uh elizabeth banks maya rudolph i mean it's uh mm uh a lot of people that are good but yeah it's just one of those it's not very good at all stay away stay away all right that's such a disappointment Mm-hmm. should i do another wall i recommend i don't have anything to warn i'm gonna recommend another one well the only one i have to yeah i'll I'll wait on the warn because it's a sin video that will come after this podcast mm-hmm. i'll warn it on the in the future i'll recommend another movie but it comes with a hard caveat okay and it's black clansman okay okay my hard caveat i'll go with first he ends this movie the way Vice ends. He cuts to real world footage yes. of modern day racism. Yes. As though I don't understand that was his point with the whole movie. I got you. And it. <sighs> You're wrong, but I got you. <laughs> it. I didn't feel like the movie needed that. And it kind of killed my joy, it killed my buzz at the end of the movie. Um. Maybe some people need that, and that's why it's there. Mm-hmm. I think some people do need that. However, the people who do need that probably aren't watching the exactly. movie. Exactly. That's that's the problem. Uh, but I, I I reacted to that differently. And of course, I reacted to Vice differently than you guys did too. But uh, that Charlottesville thing at the end of Black Klansman like nearly had me in tears. Mm-hmm um and it and the reason why he did put it in there is uh i i understand what you're getting at i think the reason why he put it in there though is that i think people believe we have reached a level where in 2019 where that type of thing can't happen anymore and when uh you know back in the day when he was talking about birth of a nation and all that you know the ku klux klan was a was a joke Mm-hmm. And then that sort of brought back those feelings again of of people going, oh yeah, I'm I'm actually uh, that sounds like a good philosophy to me, and uh, he can't and he and he and and in that case, I mean, he's bringing up Charlottesville to show that yes, again, this is happening, and we're not, and we think we're such, we think we're modern, we think we're modern people that can't uh, allow that type of thing to happen again. I understand. But then, don't what, uh, okay. I totally get what you're saying, mm-hmm. and I I reacted to that differently. I just feel like if that's if that's what we're doing, then every movie about racism in the past should end with news footage of modern racism. I don't know about that. I I actually I totally see what you're saying on this too, and I see the Vice parallels, but with Vice. And you and I have similar opinions on Vice. With Vice, he was director splaining to us essentially the whole time. 
right? He was hand feeding us. Yes. This is our, you know, our, our type of thing. In this one, Spike's definitely got a message and he's, he's not even handed at all, nor should he be. But I think he's, he's more letting the performances speak for themselves. And then this is a coda that, that brings it into the present. Well, I, maybe, so it works for me. Maybe it would have worked better for me if it had been a coda, like a post credits thing or something that let the movie stand on its own. Like I was watching the whole movie and I was thinking about Charlottesville. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was thinking about how this is showing me that nothing has really ever changed. Um, so for me, I guess creatively it didn't work and apparently it did for you guys. And I think we can agree to disagree there because yeah. otherwise I loved the movie. Yeah. Um, I think it has more N words than a Tarantino film. Oh, sure. Yeah. But I, and I think Adam Driver somehow didn't win every award known to man for his like he's somehow like a surfer stoner in the way he re- he's like originally he's so casual about this he's whole perfect thing. he's like oh you want me to pretend to be okay i'll go pretend to be go, go be even in tense situations yeah. like he reacts in his character yeah. in the movie yeah with casual just like ah yeah. whatever man now yeah. who's the guy that plays the main character washington yeah it's denzel's son he's john, da- john david washington I, yeah. know, I don't want to take anything away from him he's great um, but I thought Adam Driver stood out to me. I like, I love that guy. He's, yeah. he's done three di- for me. He's played three different things like girls, and then this, and then like the Last Jedi. Like he he's shown me enough range. I'm really excited. You got to watch Logan gonna... Lucky, man. If you're if you're on an Adam well, yeah. Driver kid, yeah, especially yeah. Yeah, he's uh he's I think he's one of our best yeah. current actors right I, now. Anyway, I loved Black Klansman. I didn't like the end. I, I, I think there's another part to that that Charlottesville thing. I don't know if um I don't know if it's necessarily in this in this movie saying that nothing has changed. I think he's saying that a lot of us we'll put something like in the back of our heads as, as something that doesn't have any power anymore. Like in, you know, and he goes back, like I said, to the birth of a nation where Ku Klux Klan was no longer Mm -hmm. an entity, really an entity anymore. But then that movie fostered enough positive goodwill for Klansmen that people started, it started to get to rise up again. And then it went back down and then it started coming back up after the civil rights Mm -hmm. and everything. And then we thought, okay, it's back down. We all look at them like a bunch of rednecks and they don't, they don't matter anymore. And it's gone down again. And then somebody does something in the, you know, clan's name or Nazi's name or whatever and says, all right, it's, it's, it's back on. And there's people out there going, Oh, really? I can, I can be that way. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, and it, it, it's sort of more of an ebb and flow. Although I think if you were. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think if if you were to ask him, he'd say, yeah, things basically haven't changed mm-hmm. uh, just concerning racism itself. But yeah. this in this case, it's a dangerous, violent group and and they're uprising and then come back down, uprising again and then um, whatever. I understand what you're saying, because when you're watching a movie and you're getting into that movie and then suddenly like out of nowhere, there's like something that's not, you know, the the way it's shot and whatever is disconnected from that movie it takes you a little bit out of it and then i know when it first came on i was like oh is he is he really doing this but then i just sort of surrendered it's, yeah it's a connection that you that you feel for all because you have the blatant injustice all throughout the movie you have the self-aggrandizing clansmen thinking that they're hot shit and then you have their ultimate defeat quote unquote and then you have this running thread of the the current situation going through and that's why it works for me mm-hmm. totally understand though what'd you think of uh topher I th- <sighs> he was kind of forgettable for me so i think to- he's supposed to play that character that way yeah i think he was instructed to do that um i was almost ex- one note it's one note yeah like the the happy racist like mm-hmm. the casual ra- and i get that it's important to show that and that that's who that guy is um it's the it's the guy in the local clan who was the right hand man who's suspicious of Adam Driver the whole way. That's the guy I think probably ended up in therapy after this movie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's true. Because I know Topher did, and I, and I get it. But if he did, then this other guy definitely fucking did. Because that guy he had had to say every hateful thing that's said in this movie. Yeah, and he threw in Jews in there. I don't too. know how you do that. I'd be so. I don't think I could do it as even as an actor. I think it'd be too hard. 
you'd have to be in a secure spot, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and and working for somebody like Spike Lee, where it's like, this is my vision. Yeah. This is... I want you to say these things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, to his credit, I think, he's he's telling a real story through the lens of, of an agenda that I think needs to be cultivated Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so yeah i i agree with you laura harrier is so good in that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can you believe she was the girl in spider-man i can homecoming she's she's she carries herself pretty well yeah but she carries herself fiercely in this that's that's what i mean is that like just the girl in spider-man i guess she was acting yeah she seemed much more demure and soft-spoken and the girl in this movie controls not fucking around no she's the boss <laughs> yeah, yeah and she the actress has played both sides of that really really well yeah, yeah i'm a fan mm-hmm. uh speaking of fierce i watched beyonce's homecoming <laughs> okay on netflix all right is that the coachella concert video that's the coachella concert video. so it's it's literally her singing for two hours it's her <laughs> it's a perform it's a it's a it's a performance okay but it's not it's not a movie she filmed that played on a screen behind her while she sang at Coachella. No, it's it's the it's the performance in Coachella, and it's supplemented with. Did you guys ever see This Is It, the Michael yeah. Jackson yes. thing? Did you like that? Uh, so long ago, I couldn't answer. Did it, you like it? it? Yeah, it was fine. It was better than I thought it would be because mm-hmm. it was literally just rehearsals of concerts and stuff like that. But somehow. It was kind of riveting, it was right? One of our, I think it was one of our first 3D movies that we played at Hollywood 27. It was one of the. It was when we weren't playing many of them. Uh-huh. Oh, it was 3D. Yeah, it was. Wow. Um, and uh, I think we had a couple of those, but uh, yeah, yeah, there's, it's good. There's some of that in here. the The movie, I will call it movie on Netflix, is over two hours. It's like two ten or something like that, and probably. 15% of that are these cutaway vignettes of her planning all this. Cause it took eight months to plan like four months of the vocal stuff. And then four months of the choreography mm. all for two nights, two hours each. And they intersperse. It's like uh, that Chris rock special that interspersed three different performances. You know what I'm talking about? It was a bigger and blacker. Or was it the, the one after that where he did one in South Africa he did one in New York, and he did one in L.A., and they cut between the, the three uh, of them. Oh, okay. Anyway, it, it, they cut it back and forth between the two nights. And I don't like everything that Beyonce does. I've got a few wonder songs that I think are fantastic, uh, but I probably really love like maybe 30% of her catalog, hmm. and she does a, a decent amount from that other 70%. But every time I'm like, well, she's losing me with this. There's some sort of visual beauty that absolutely just brings me back in she's she's backed by a marching band that's like cajun influence she's backed by these unbelievable dancers that are all shapes and sizes uh she's she's got a guest spot from jay-z which is fine in that context she's got a guest spot with destiny's child uh which i think is actually the low point of the the show but the highs are absolute do they do no 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 is that even them? When it's really, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think that's... Is that? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, they do say my name and all that stuff. Uh, but the stuff that she does, like, with the, the the way that she does single ladies, the way that she does uh, some of our other hits, man, it's fucking great. I, I It's a big recommend. All right. Well, all right. I don't, I'm don't. not a big Beyonce fan. We've reached a really weird age for music. Mm-hmm. Because... A lot of what is mainstream, hugely popular, it's not reaching me. Mm. Like, because I do not subscribe to Tidal, mm-hmm. uh, my wife, I think, uses Spotify, but I don't have any of those streaming services. If I'm listening to music, it's because I'm in the car or I'm on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And so all of her, like, what was that? Did she do like a movie album? Of oh, Lemonade. Lemonade. Yeah. I don't know shit about that. Yeah. And like I opened up Twitter the day that she dropped this movie or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it, half the trending topics are about Beyonce and everyone's talking about, oh, this song is fire and this song is great and this song is... I'm like, I don't know if I'm ever going to hear any of these songs. I am almost where you're at, honestly. I'm Because I, I don't like any of the stuff that she did 
with the Carters. I thought that was that was bad. Most of Lemonade was a little too self indulgent and too much relying on her syncopation and rapping instead of actually singing. Uh, but there was some that was amazing. So I'm kind of there with you. But this is such a spectacular that uh, it's worth it's uh, worth checking. Have out. a good look. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get good and fucked up before you watch this. Well, you know I'm capable, and of you that. will have yourself a good time. It's funny, and uh, while we have a little uh, break in what we're trying to do here, uh, when we were in Washington, there was one movie that somebody, that two people have brought up on Facebook, and I was like, oh yeah, I guess we forgot that, but uh, 10 Things I Hate About You was in Seattle. And I thought that was based in LA, though. Mm, it's, uh, I was re- I, after that comment came on, I went to Wikipedia and said mm. it was based in Seattle. I'm right! What? The the Destiny's no, no, no. Child has a song called No, 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 No. When it's really yeah 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 so I don't I don't, don't cut it now because now it makes me look smart <laughs> yeah so leave it, it makes in. me look dumb anyway uh, we we all I think we all like ten things I hate about you in this room right oh, yes absolutely uh, we do indeed it uh, to showed uh, definitely showed us early on that Heath Ledger was was going to be a star I think and uh, of course I love Julia Stiles even Joseph Gordon Levitt um yeah fares well here and uh you mean dante's peak joseph gordon levitt <laughs> yes yes it's also in the river runs through it as like a four-year-old <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah, oh he's yeah been, he's um, been working since he was in the womb <laughs> yeah oh, david yeah. crumholtz is in this david crumholtz is really funny uh one of those movies that is like it's a it it, it it has basic romantic comedy elements, but it has so much like more layers in it. Mm-hmm. And know? it is loosely based on Taming of the Shrew, so mm-hmm. that may be part of why is that there's already a reliable story mm-hmm. structure there that we're kind of building on. Yeah, and but. she flashes the 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 detention teacher. Yeah, to, who is? I don't know his name. Just tell it's me who the he guy. Is. It's, it's the guy it's from the guy from fucking uh, Come Independence on. Day. No, no, it's, who is it? It's the guy from Galaxy Quest. The pilot, Tommy. Tommy Weber. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yep, yep. It's been a minute since I saw it. <clears throat> um, God, I can't remember his name either. We've said it before. We have. I feel bad. <laughs> he was on Ed, the bowling alley. But I don't, I don't think he. she flashed him. She flashed um, the uh, the detention guy. Oh, he was just the teacher in the other scene? The teacher, the main, the main teacher in the other scene was the classroom. This was detention. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, it was, uh, was it David Leisure? Ooh, that's a good pull if it was. Oh, because she flashes to sneak out, right? Yes. And then they go play paintball. Yes, and she thinks that he didn't uh, she didn't see it. And then they're on the boat later, and, and uh, he goes, there's not too many girls out there who would uh, flash a teacher to get out of school uh, for him. Right, right. And she's like, oh, you saw it? Yeah, it's David Leisure. And then, uh, yeah, Larry Miller's funny in that movie, too, yes, playing the is. father. Um, it was, it, it, it said, it's just a, it's just a, what, it's just a prom. It's just dancing. And he's like, and hell is just a sauna. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You want to do some cues? Let's do some cues. Do All some right. Cues. We're going to start off with Jeremy's favorite subject. Question. Question. I got something to say. I want the truth. I am listening. Ooh. MacGruber. MacGruber. That's even uh, better. So after hearing Jeremy gush about MacGruber, I don't know. I'm so after hearing Jeremy gush about MacGruber once again, I decided to check it out, and I loved it. Uh, it got me thinking, what other SNL sketch characters would you like to see have a full-length movie? Personally, Matt Foley, motivational speaker, is the obvious pick for me. So before we get to him, there's only been a handful of successful SNL skits to movies, right? Wayne's World, you could argue MacGruber. Even Blues though Brothers. Now, Blues Brothers was a musical act on SNL, but it wasn't a sketch, was it? I mean, uh, same difference. Maybe it was. It's still, I mean, I would still say that that was part of that lineage. Okay. Uh, yeah. But well, yes, they-, they did come out and play just songs. Like, I, even that, I referred to that Carrie Fisher episode that I saw. They were on that, and they were just they just sang songs. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. I'm, maybe that's the most successful then of all time. Yeah, you have uh, yeah. I mean, and then you have stuff that's mildly successful, like Coneheads had a like it was a decent like. Of course, that came out way after the Coneheads were even a mm-hmm. oh yeah uh, were even a thing that people talked about. And then uh, then in the nineties, there were just a string of them. Night at the Roxbury. There was Ladies Man. There was it's a, Pat. Ladies Man is funny to me. Yeah, I didn't like. It's Pat. 
Uh, Superstar. 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 A lot of these have Will Ferrell in them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. But uh, what I'm saying is that these don't have a good track record. Nope. Besides no. maybe Wayne's World. And, because, and once again, these are good as skits. Mm. And when you flesh them out, you've you've lost all what's funny this about is them. What the, this is the problem with me for The Onion. Uh, it's good for a headline, <laughs> yeah. but once you start writing a whole article, I stop laughing. Mm-hmm. Like it's not yeah. as funny. But you have to put the whole article there, or you're not really p- finishing the joke. Yeah. But I just read the headlines because yeah. that's actually too. the mm-hmm. funny part. Yeah. So my answer for this, I'm going to jump in uh, mm-hmm. early, um, is that um, there used to be this character that Tracy Morgan played, played at least twice, uh, maybe three times. Uh, and he was this homeless guy who was insane. And he lived in the sewer. I remember this. Yes. <laughs> and like Britney Spears. And I, I, he's either another singer or maybe it was like Par- a Paris Hilton type or somebody ended up down in the sewer with him. Uh, and he, he makes up gibberish songs and sings them to her. <laughs> and I just remember the one song to Britney Spears. He sings, take a doodle pie. Uh, so that's the kind of lyrics he sings. But he sells this this character so hard. And it's, it's absurd. It's absurd. And the movie would suck, as almost anyone would. Uh, but that's the one I would. If you gave me the money and the permission, I would I would say, Tracy, make a feature. Give me 90 minutes of that guy. She ends up singing along with him. Doesn't oh, yeah. She? Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's some good shit. What is man. the plot to this movie, though? Uh, maybe it's an origin story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or maybe it's one of those rags to riches. He goes from homeless songwriter in the sewer to like winning a Grammy. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, all these S- SNL skits turned into movies have ridiculous premises. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you'd have to you have to twist it somehow. But that was the first. <laughs> you honestly, like the ladies' first man, by the way. Yeah, I do. There's something about Tim Meadows, man. Uh, yeah, he's excellent. I was watching uh, Walk Hard again yesterday. He just, he, he, he just makes me giggle. Yep. Like, even when Dewey's in his Bob Dylan phase and the other two band members are like, what is this song about? And he's like, man, you two are stupid. This is the best song ever. Like, he, just, he just sells it so funny. I don't know. Well, I just and like that and uh, Mean Girls has been playing a bunch, too, lately. And, like, that whole... He's... he's the, when they... When they end, when the, there's the, the, the trouble at the school and all the... the I guess the juniors or the seniors the seniors i guess are all fighting all the senior girls are fighting and everything and that whole thing where he's like we're gonna get to the bottom of this today and i will keep you in here as long as it takes and the woman is like we can only keep them here till four well i will keep you here till four <laughs> <laughs> even before that when there's the riot in the, the hallways he fucking grabs a baseball bat <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah just gets out there yeah. like ready to fucking rumble it's great yeah and there's that thing that uh that Ariana Grande recently uh, took a spoofed on where they're, they're all talking to the camera and they're all like, I hear that blah, blah, blah is doing this and that today. And yep. Tim, Tim Meadows is one of them, the principal. I think that Lindsay Lohan has started to date this guy. It's it, here that they're happy <laughs> 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 or something like that. Uh, but yeah, Tim Meadows, man. Uh, I, I don't remember if I saw the movie, uh, but I do remember that skit. Uh, that sketch and i remember him being really funny in it oh the ladies man yeah mm-hmm. uh i'm gonna go with a, a a recent one and and again i think all of these will probably be awful movies <laughs> but uh there's a there's a character that kate mckinnon plays called sheila sauvage yeah and uh, she's this uh just like i guess would you call her homely like downtrodden woman at a bar and she always seems during last call to find that one dude who's just as desperate and lonely as she <laughs> is. And there's always some make out session. And it seems like they keep on trying to top each other every time they do this yep. with whatever kind of gross make out that they can do. And then there's always the cut to Keenan Thompson who plays the bartender who's always like, like the one that happened in this last week's episode he call he's like hello cdc i would like to i'd like to report two new viruses <laughs> <laughs> and and uh and you know and as it keeps going on and on like the the sight gags start getting more ridiculous too like he's got this big um, there's a point where he's so disgusted by what he sees he has this thing around his face uh it was like all right well it's closing time and he's like and he like turns this thing and it's you know one of those metal garage door <laughs> things that come down security <laughs> orders or whatever over his eyes or whatever um and it's stuff like that and if you wanted to explore the character of sheila sauvage i would hope that they would do if they did this in a hollywood style they would make this 
she's looking for love and she's going to find it in all the wrong places <laughs> and all that and she and they're going to try to make it where she finds her true love mm-hmm. i wouldn't do that yeah i would just make it about her life and how how awful it is double down on the skis yes yeah, and double yeah. down on the skis but you know if they made this movie it would be like until he walked into the door yeah. you know <laughs> you and, know my favorite part of those sketches are the the acrobatics that they have to go around to describe disgusting sex yes. acts. Yes. Because she's always like, well, you can pull in my back door as long as you choke me out with my front. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, just the, the, the nastiest shit that you can ever well, think it's, of. It's really like, it's really like worse. Yo, totally. they, they, they get, a, they get away <laughs> with it because they're not saying anything that's just, <laughs> just outright in your face. But the, the stuff they're describing is the grossest <laughs> stuff ever. You can spit roast me like a suckling pig. Or yeah. <laughs> it's that's the one that's coming in <laughs> why do i keep thinking that uh, image is in my head now i don't know so yeah it's it's it's, it's basically a whole bunch of that that they're the flirtation is always these dirty things and then they start making out and then keenan thompson does his stuff and yeah i'm trying to remember who are the guys on those because they're sometimes like zach galifianakis or like louis ck mm-hmm. and stuff like that but then there's some like movie stars that have done this and they'll like scuzz themselves well and this and last that. one was adam sandler so oh, yeah yeah no, that sandler had, uh, that was his return after 25 years yeah, he had yeah. not been back to saturday night live is that a good episode uh it's got a couple of decent sketches just like any saturday night live yeah, yeah. uh you know it, it was interesting reading reviews of that of that episode afterwards they're saying it's weird. Adam Sandler's like the most professional person in this cast, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a there's a really good sketch of him uh, uh, doing some sort of tourist thing, and it's one of those basic like, "Hey, I'm Bob from blah blah blah's uh, tours and whatever," and and you think it's going to be just one of these regular things, but like the whole sketch is about how just because you go and do this you won't be a different person i can't promise that you'll be happier i can't (laughs) promise that (laughs) if you decide to drink that you you know that you'll not be like uh you won't be an alcoholic anymore or you know like it just keeps (laughs) on going through all these different things uh the promises of the uh the whole thing but it's it was it was a pretty funny i think i caught that um so we've been watching barry 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 we've been watching barry obsessively to do this other podcast which is called starting now by the way coming soon if it's not already out there and i think bill Hader is up there with kate mckinnon as the best snl performers of the last 10 maybe more years Mm -hmm. bill Hader, obviously he's shown in in dramas like skeleton twins and he's shown in barry has the dramatic chops to pull off pretty much anything and we know he's funny in fact after watching Barry so much, it almost covers up that you forget how funny he is mm-hmm. because he's got funny moments in there and all that stuff. But and the show is funny, but he's so wrapped he's up. A in the, he's a straight man all the way through. He's a straight man, but like I could totally see this working. And this isn't even a sketch. I could see a Stefan movie because think about it and make it and make it not necessarily like a straightforward comedy. Like have him go to these places. <laughs> And see like all the the little the little people on roller skates and shit all like the newest that. clubs. He keeps <laughs> going to the newest clubs. clubs, and it's like a descent into madness. And like every club starts getting crazier and crazier and crazier. And you can have John Mulaney write the actual script, right? Like mm-hmm. this is what we're gonna have. You're gonna have uh, Abe Vigoda there, the ghost of Abe Vigoda. Um, but you could have him like continuing into this descent into the craziness of the New York club scene and make it like a like you were describing climax or something mm. like that make it even atmospheric and 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 surreal and things like that and throw in some comedy bits too and mm-hmm. i think he could totally pull this i off. think you should take stefan and put him in a reboot of hitch mm. and he's the ava mendez character and he's a critic about clubs <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so throughout make the all course of the movie he's visiting all these clubs as part of his job yeah but also finds a female will smith and they do the dance and then he kicks her in the head on the jet ski and then sexism roll credits Mm, sexism (laughs) roll credits (laughs) Uh, but also another one did you ever watch it enough to to see the californians recurring sketch Uh, i've seen it Mm -mm. 
I could never really figure out the Californians. I thought it was funny, but I don't know exactly what they're going for. There. They're going for inside baseball for California because it's, that's what people talk about, like getting on the 405 right, right, and right. all that. And like, um, and Jeremy knows who I'm talking about. The uh, guy who used to run real SEO. I brought that sketch up to him and he was like, Oh yeah, that is exa- That's Californians. That's, <laughs> that's for sure. amazing because the, there's a lot of layers to those things though mm-hmm. like the accents and the whole familial relations and everybody's cheating on each other and everybody's talking about the organic food stuff that they just tried and all that stuff and it's it's wealth and all that stuff but i have but i think yeah it just boils down to like the traffic yeah, jokes it's basically. traffic jokes <laughs> you gotta go on the 405 and then you gotta take this exit and so on but yeah they 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 marry that into the cheesy soap opera yeah. thing and you know what are you doing you know, here? i think with fred armison bill Hader, kate mckinnon uh fucking Kristen wig like with all those performers back mm-hmm. i think you could make an interesting you know you hour make a, and 15 minute a uh, clue like movie yeah exactly yeah. yeah with those like little eccentricities thrown in there mm-hmm. uh including like the how did you get here you yeah, i took the five to the four yeah. five. <laughs> yeah. uh i would i would probably watch that if you had all those people and those writers come back to it mm-hmm. yeah you want to do another one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, has there ever been a movie that gave you an entirely new perspective on a city or region? For example, Moonlight gave me a radically different look at Miami in contrast to everything else I've seen in movies and shows. I can imagine, mm-hmm. right? I really appreciate it for that. It's probably the most honest representation of my hometown. This person's from Miami that I've ever seen. Ooh. What do we think? Um, so most uh, movies set in England are going to be London or they're going to be old England. Mm-hmm. And usually London, Oldie. and usually yeah, and usually London then too. Uh, but Hot Fuzz uh, gives you that uh, the example of a small town in the UK, and sometimes it's hard to re- it's hard to remember that they don't have they have more than just London out there, yeah, yeah, and Manchester. But like uh, you know, I, I've been I've been to England, I've been to the countryside, so I, you know, I. I have experienced that, but still, even with that, uh, I still, you know, if someone says England, I immediately go London, London, yeah. but hot fuzz. And this is not a real town. San, apparently I, I read up on this, uh, too, that the, the, when cops are training, they call any kind of small town Sanford as a, as a, uh, like just as a go-to. Hmm. Um, and, in, and, uh, so Sanford, there is, there is apparently a Sanford, but there's not, it's not this, this one that they portray in hot fuzz, hmm. but seeing a small town like that and seeing like, uh, you know, was, uh, is just a, a fun window into smaller town life in England and everything. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not anything that you're used to as, as an American watching, you know, watching all the movies. So I had a, sort of a different perspective, I guess, in just the fact that I know that it exists and that it's, you know, it's kind of like all the small towns around here too, yeah. even. Mm-hmm. Original Wicker Man does that to a certain extent too. Yeah. yeah. Obviously it's a very different town, mm-hmm. but, uh, it's interesting seeing it from that perspective in that time, like how you would survive. They don't even have... If they have electricity, it's very sparse. Mm-hmm. You know, they have to work for their water and stuff like that. And this is like the seventies too. It's yeah, not like and it's they're on the an 30s. island, I yeah, think, yeah. too. So it, was, it adds even more. They have to know. get their supplies from like seaplane and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Hmm. Mm, what do you think? I well, my cheating answer would be the wire. Oh yeah, because I actually lived in Baltimore. I grew up there for the first six years of my life so not a ton of memories but what i do remember was a quaint little suburb and orioles games and the harbor (laughs) and then you watch the wire and i'm like this shit was here the whole time it was just not part of the world that i saw Mm -hmm. um and it's everything i'm talking about not just the drug dealers and the row houses but the cops and the newspapers like the, the schools and the teachers that are struggling, like, showed me a Baltimore I'd never seen before. That's my cheating answer. Mm. My non-cheating answer, I'm going to go with Showgirls. And it didn't give me a better appreciation of Vegas, but it gave me a different perspective of Vegas. Because uh-huh. prior to Showgirls, Vegas was, to me, from the consumer's perspective. Yeah. Right? The shows, the casinos, the lights, the performances, yada. You don't think, I didn't, think about the 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of workers required to make that run, not all of whom live in luxury. And so Showgirl shows us like that dance guy, seedy apartment in a bad neighborhood. Yeah. And she and her roommate live, live in a trailer, I think. Or, yep. And it just shows me that sort of working class Vegas mm -hmm. that I had never seen before. Yeah, and she busts her ass for it, too. She does. She does. You have to believe that most people in Vegas are busting their ass, not making a lot of money, hoping to make it big, and probably What don't. is she trying to do out there? Is she trying to just dance, or is she trying to be Gina Gershon's featured performer? And is that, like, the, the limit to her her desire out there? Uh, it's been a while since I've seen I think seen what it. she wants changes from scene to scene. Okay, okay. She I just wants so. a break. And then she gets a break, and she wants more, and then she sees a chance to take Gina Gershon's crown, and she wants that, and I don't know. But and that's what she is, right? She's like the featured performer in some rando some they, Caesar's Palace. Do they move to Vegas? Do they do these things where people come out and dance topless? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Like with but like I've, hundreds of people in oh, the audience. But I've I've never I've never been any of those shows. Uh, oh really? Un unfortunately, <laughs> um, uh, I have I I did go to a, a Cirque du Soleil where they were topless. Hmm. Um, the uh, the one that's uh, the zoo, the Zoomanity one. Mm -hmm. Uh, at New York, New York. Um, so I know, yeah, I know this stuff happens. I just, I've just never been to one. Interesting. But, oh, they're fun as hell to go to. Ooh. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, uh, yeah, his, that's, that seems to be sort of her apex in the, in the movie is to, to reach that kind of, uh, that kind of stardom to have a, you know, a Vegas show. Which is funny because and, these people can't be paid very, very well. I don't. I don't think so. So I maybe it's I just think for they the are. fame of it. I think they are. Well, it's implied um, that Gershon is living luxuriously, mm -hmm. and then also she's living in the casino, isn't she? I think so. Yeah. But there's also there's a reason that modern like singers like Britney Spears yeah. and Celine Dion are doing like residencies in Vegas. What I was profitable as fuck. That's yes. what I was getting at. Was that you know there's a reason why you, they performers go and have that full year round thing because they're getting paid guys of money now that is britney spears and that is celine dion but mm -hmm. uh i think these if if that show is as popular as they're saying it is then they're probably getting paid pretty well and and in within this you know small scope of vegas or whatever they're famous uh whatever but uh yeah i don't i don't think there's ever any part where she's like i hope to be in la and an actress and mm -mm. All yeah, that. that's she just wants to be a dancer. I'm a dancer. Yeah. Right? Uh, and yeah. she goes from stripper to She makes to it sound dancer, like the, the nudity to... is like not even part of her concern. Like No, no, no. That she no, I'm a dancer. I just happen to choose nudity dancing as my path. I could have mm -hmm. chosen clothed dancing. Mm hmm I chose stripping. This uh, movie's starting to like get an actual cult. It's got following. an it's got an actual cult. I know it, I know it's always had one, but it seems like it's it's getting more and more yeah it's so trashy and so like out there that it's yeah. gotten that kind of uh oh, i need to revisit it it's isn't it long it is yeah. it is long uh it's funny the the dude coming in uh the, the dude coming in and uh like when they're about to try out and he's like they must call you pollyanna and she's like what did you call me and that's her like real name or whatever and like and and she and you know everything is just like dialed up to 11 on everything <laughs> it everything. is you know oh my god i keep using it's not a very good outtake because he, there's a lot of noise but it's the re the wig master from uh seinfeld you know the red-haired guy yeah he comes. He's the dance. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Corraler. Mm -hmm. He's the one that pit, picks the ones that are going to be in. Mm -hmm. And he's going like, he's he's walking around, and they're on the ground like thrusting their hips. He's like, thrust it, thrust it. <laughs> yeah. And then he gets right next to Elizabeth Elizabeth uh, Perkins uh, Hurley. Elizabeth Hurley's face. <laughs> it's not Elizabeth. Uh, uh, it's Elizabeth Berkeley. Berkeley. <laughs> right, her face, and he's like, thrust it, thrust it. Yeah. There's too many. He's going like. <laughs> <laughs> that that also has showgirls also has that all-time classic line robert davi who's the sleazy strip club guy uh comes to see the show or whatever and then like that he and the the like the the overweight lady that's like always showing her her, her boobs to everybody and everything go and like congratulate her on this show and everything and davi just before he leaves he's like must be nice to be in a place where they don't come on you. 
<laughs> I definitely have to watch this movie again. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh. Anyway, uh, two Boston movies made me appreciate Boston a lot. I hadn't been to Boston uh, when I saw Goodwill Hunting. But you see so many things about Boston. You see Faneuil Hall, and you see the the fucking Harvard, and then you see Fenway, and you see uh, what is it, the Beacon Hill, and stuff like that. But Goodwill Hunting like put it in perspective because they go to Boston Commons because he's in North Boston. Sean's in North Boston, but Will lives in Southie, which is obviously South and all that stuff. And it shows him on the train right up there. And then you think, and when you actually have gone to Boston, how far away Cambridge is from that to see, uh, what's her name? Mini Driver. Cooper. Mini Driver. Mini Cooper. Um, Elizabeth Hurley. <laughs> yep. And that's a long fucking train ride. Like, that's probably a good, like, hour and a half or something like that. So it's interesting to just show, like, the, the different geography of Boston that you don't always see. A movie that did this even better, I think, is The Town. Mm-hmm. Of course, it ends up in Fenway and all that stuff. But it gives you a nice, you know, impression of the different neighborhoods around there versus just like the, you know, the the downtown or the commons or that kind of thing. But, That's how you drive a fucking car. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I do think that a lot of Goodwill Hunting was shot in Toronto. But I, but I know what you're, I, I know what you're saying though. Oh yeah. Um, it, it, it I, I'm only saying this because I know that there's going to be some people. Who are like, well, that wasn't even Boston. But the the point is not that we're seeing the exact Boston and everything. It's the, the essence the, of Boston. the essence of Boston. Yeah. So, yeah. by um, the way, I went to Boston mm-hmm. not so long ago. Um, have you ever been on the Boston subway? Oh yeah. I thought I was gonna die because uh, it's like, why? well, the car I rode on. Now, granted, I rode from the airport to Boston Common, uh-huh. and it was. A hundred year old train car. Oh. And it didn't go in a straight line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It went up and down and rickety <laughs> over and I was like, I'm gonna die underground in Boston. <laughs> I don't know how that shit keeps working. That's interesting because I was actually on my way to Logan Airport from where we were staying in Midtown or whatever. And I thought we were gonna die because there was a guy on the the same train. It was just me, my wife, and this other guy who was eyeball fucking the shit out of me mm. and looked like he was going to come over and rob us. Mm. And so I, I reached, I typically carry like a pocket knife, like a pretty, you know, aggressive pocket knife. And I was, I reached down to get that just to show him. And I had flown, so I didn't have my knife with me. Mm. So I grabbed my phone and started uh, dialing and Deep he bop. backed up. Deep bop, mm. Nice. Interesting. Good, quick thinking. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, if it, that didn't work, then I just have to try I to have, strangle the fucking guy. I have guy. Uh, knife points in the tips of my boots like the Joker in Dark Knight. Oh, nice. Mm, nice. Mm, Very good. I don't really. Uh, I will do some honorable mentions because um, High Fidelity has a really good uh, depiction of Chicago outside of the regular confines of Chicago. He does go downtown a few times. She works downtown. One of those speeches he gives is actually on one of the bridges over uh, the uh, in the Chicago River. But by and large, it's in a it's set in a place uh, off Honor Street called uh, well, it's in between Wicker Park and uh, Bucktown, uh, just north of that. So that gives you a nice like neighborhood vibe. Mm, bus town, huh? You want to do one more? Let's do one more. Okay, do, let's do I the think music. we need one more. Hey, from London, UK. Hello. Mm-hmm. In case you confused it with London, Toronto. Hello. Oh yeah. I'm gonna do this. The rest of it in my faux British accent. Okay. Loving the podcast. Always enjoy Mondays as there's always a great sin cast to listen to. Hard to keep a straight face while listening to this at work. <laughs> My question is, what movie has the, <laughs> what, what movie has the best song for the final scene of its... <laughs> You only have like three more words. No, that's it. Oh, all right. Well, uh, Sympathy for the Devil in Fallen with Denzel mm. and John Goodman and Donald mm. Sutherland, which has been running on the movie channels. Has it really? Yes. Okay, so you saw it recently. Yes, twice. Okay, when does the music start up there? Because he smokes the cigarette, right? Yes. 
Uh, and it, it, you know, he smokes. No, no, no. I'm not. No, I. I'm afraid you're going to put me on the spot with a question I don't know the answer to. Like, is seen it building it up to where he smokes the cigarette and stuff like that, and then the camera pans away? Or no, he it- smokes a cigarette, and John Goodman's there. John Good. The the demons in John Goodman. And oh, that's right. He already, he's already done with it. Denzel's yeah, like, I'm him. smoking a poison that's cigarette. Right, that's right. And the camera goes up, and then the, you hear the music. I got you. And then you see the cat come running around Dude. the building, and then you hear the voice. I told you I was going to tell you about a time I almost died. Dude, that movie is so much fun. <laughs> it, no, it, it, no one talks about this movie, <laughs> and it's so good. Uh, but that song choice is perfect. Uh, they use another Rolling Stones song all the way through the movie with mm-hmm. The Time Is On My Side, mm-hmm. uh, and that's how the demon sings that to him, and that's how he knows where it is for a lot of it, and then they come in with sympathy for the devil. That's the demon's Hail Hydra. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is. Uh, anyway, yeah, recommend that movie, but that's that was the first thing that came to my mind. Okay. Um, one song that I've... I. Uh, I actually bought just just based on hearing it at the end, but uh, the Middle East's blood at the end of Crazy Stupid Love um, is a, a great song to me, especially how they time it all out with to get to the the credits and everything. But it's this nice little you know do 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 you know, and it's just oh, yeah. and uh, and like uh, it's just everybody. It's it's the happy ending, you mm-hmm. know, and everybody's you know there is the weird uh the weird scene where the the girl who's like in love with steve carell gives her nude photos to his son mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> and that's a and happy she, thing yeah yeah she gives him a wink or something like yeah. that or like a kiss on the She's cheek like you know you know i just wanted to know that you know you uh you love my dad and a few years i'll look like my dad and then they'll come for you and she's like well here's something to until then or whatever it's like here's my nude here's body my badge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fucked up yeah it's very <laughs> fucked up but in the movie it's so sweet anyway yeah, the yeah julianne moore sidles up to steve carell and she's like i'm glad you bought me that ice cream and all that and this you know ding, 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 and then whatever but then it swells up for the for the credits and then you know it's that big chorus and everything yeah. ah, 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 you know and all that and it's like uh it's a it's it's awesome it's perfect so it's one of those songs the and uh the other one i mean i think rolling stones tends to show up in a lot of these but uh it is also i don't think it's the ending of the movie but the credits of both the devil's advocate and uh <laughs> and full metal jacket have painted black mm-hmm. uh, which is always a great way to send off <laughs> vanity <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely my greatest <laughs> uh crazy stupid love uh, i like it like maybe 70 percent more than i did the first time it's one of those it. movies when you first watch it it's it's like yeah okay i kind of like that and then i this is one of those that I, you know, it was on cable uh, during a period of time where I was just sitting there. Wa- I'd watch it over and over again. Yeah. Ryan Gosling's accent threw me off so much when I first watched that. He has an accent? He's He's got that stupid Brooklyn tough oh, boy yeah, yeah, yeah. accent that has nothing to do with his character. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think I think everybody in that movie has grown on me. Mm-hmm. Uh, even even the I was kind of skeezed out by the whole girl babysitter thing mm-hmm. myself the first time, but you know you could kind of see these are natural feelings. I thought Steve Carell was way over the top with this whole like she's fucking Kevin Bacon thing or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, and it's, then, it's and, himself and, and they have that you know it's pretty unbelievable that you know he's like buddy buddy with Gosling and they're doing this pickup artist shit all the way through it and then and then Gosling's like I found the perfect woman in my dreams and then you find out that the you know Emma Stone is Steve Carell's daughter yeah. and all that is like in this one big you know like no no you can't date him I know him blah 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 that but still it's one of those where you're like I don't yeah I'll I know, shrug that off he said uh, the, the scene between ryan gosling and emma stone is fantastic yeah, yeah and i guess it probably like helped solidify them for la la land but it's that good. and the gangster movie. yeah and gangster squad <laughs> have you seen gangster no. Squad? yeah you, seen, you saw it mm. is it as terrible what as everybody says piece of shit <laughs> really yeah jesus oh my god that How was so exciting that? so exciting so many good actors in it and everything but yeah, that's another movie where where Gosling and Emma Stone are 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 uh, dating. Are they're hooked up? In yeah, mm-hmm. nice. there's yeah, there's a whole. That's I mean, it's it's crazy. Like three movies, you would swear that they're an actual couple if you watch those three movies back to back. Yeah, and within, geez, what 
eight years or so. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's yeah. Not like it's, when in reality, he's married to Eva Mendes. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's right. And she's, she's, she, uh, what is she? His wife. Yeah. No, what is Emma Stone? No, do you know who she's attached to is what I'm asking. She's attached to some guy. Okay. Um, I actually saw a thing two days ago that she was with her rumored new boyfriend who was some guy I'd never heard of. Oh, so it's nobody mm. like super famous or anything. I know that uh, it was funny. Uh, who was it that, was it Jonah Hill that was on some... He was on some interview and they asked him like, you know, so are you uh, dating anybody right now? He's like, yes, yes. And then, and then they're like, I, I don't want to say who it is and everything. And then I think that guy was like, it's not Emma Stone. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's hilarious. Uh, so my answers, by the way, the, the Fight Club uh, ending is oh, always yeah. mentioned oh, yeah. with Pixies oh, yeah. Where's My Mind. That's a perfect, perfect, mm-hmm. perfect, perfect thing. Um, but... My vote is going to go to, do you like Freddy Johnston? Mm, love him. Actually, I love the album you're going to mention. I bought the next two albums that didn't dig. The one with Bad Reputation mm-hmm. on it? Yeah. It's, I know I got a bad reputation. Mm-hmm. That song rules. And it isn't just talk, talk, talk. That plays right as the, the credits roll in Kicking and Screaming, the mm-hmm. Noah Baumbach version. If I... It's fucking awesome. Because it goes, it's like if you could, uh, if you could make Tweed into a song. Ooh, you know what I mean? That's not This bad. is a very Tweedy song and not like in a Jeff Tweedy song. Like a it it's the aesthetic of that movie is very uh New Englandy, right? Even mm-hmm. though I think it's in upstate New York. But like very hipstery almost, but like but warm too. And that's how this song is. And it's it's a nice little pop ditty and it goes perfectly with this movie. That would be that entire album would be a hard recommend from me. I th- think i own that cd i, I need you. to uh it's good from start to finish i think i have never heard of this guy in my life <laughs> we should send him the song after in show notes mm. is freedy the actual singer or is it the band no that's a that's a dude's name that's the guy freedy johnston yeah. yeah yeah no this is a great great song mm. you've seen kicking and screaming i'm sure you would recognize it mm-hmm. if you heard this it's been in other movies too oh yeah I also want to give some love to our recent guest matt mahaffey with his song or self song stay home at the end credits of uh shrek mm-hmm. yeah and it may be the best part of that movie mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> it is hilarious that that was supposed to be it's supposed to be the, the song at the beginning when shrek is getting ready yeah but uh, at the time hollywood producers were like we've got to put smash mouth in everything that's what the kids are listening to that's hilarious that katzenberg comes in and he's like where the hell's my smash mouth <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> What are the best story? Matt Matt had an amazing uh, array of stories, like Lauren Michaels in a moon pod oh, looking yeah. down. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, all right. Well, I think that's it. We covered some questions. We burned through a few, but keep them coming. Yeah, uh, that'll do it for this week. Uh, keep going to Syncast presented by Cinemasins on Facebook, uh, Cinemasins Twitter, uh, SoundCloud. Uh, we are on uh, Discord. Uh, some people were asking how to get on the Discord, but I think it's the CinemaSense Discord, right? Yes, go to Discord.com and then search for CinemaSense. Yeah, people were asking about that. I think it may have been we had people looking for a Sincast Discord. But, oh, I see. But I think it's CinemaSense Discord, and uh, and we do have a Sincast uh, channel tab, that's right, in yeah. there, or tab, yeah. Uh, but there are many ways to uh, come and uh, talk about this very episode. Anyway, uh, that'll do it for this week. It's Chris Atkins and Jeremy Scott and Barrett Sher. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasins.com. Um, uh, checking levels, um, spinning the wheel, flux capacitor, mirrors. fluxing, <laughs> engine running. <laughs> uh, I just watched that a couple of, most of it the other day. <laughs> Maybe a week or two ago, somebody had posted a deleted scene, a song, like a performance where mm-hmm. it's like, uh, it's like, fuck you or get fucked or something like that. And That's it's a bunch of kids like screaming along to it. Like, mm-hmm. it's all like uh it's it, it, the setup is him saying like you know sometimes 
uh, parents and adults really make you angry, like real like kitty style type of thing. But what you want to do is climb up on a chair and point your finger right in their chest and say, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Pearl Jam said, OK, that's it. We're not doing any. We're pulling this video and we're not doing any more. They did pull the video for for a certain for amount of time. For a while, right? you can still see it. Um but uh but I believe they decided they weren't going to do any more videos. Now, I've seen a couple of Pearl Jam videos since, but they're not in it. Like uh that one called uh It's a Revolution or something like that. It's mm-hmm. all animated. Yeah, yeah. That one I've seen, mm-hmm. but there's I don't think they've done any others, really. Any music videos music at all? Music videos. Jeez. After Jeremy. Oh, that's interesting. Um they did one for daughter didn't they maybe you're right maybe that's the only i don't think so i don't think so. anyway that's a massive derailment yes it is but we are in west virginia and we have (laughs) chances for massive derailments all the time Mm -hmm. 